What is going on everyone? My name is Adam Allard and in today's video we're going to be making this game called Ship Captain Crew using Java FX. So Ship Captain Crew is a dice game played with five dice and the objective of the game is for uh, the player to get to number to the points 25 first. They want to get to 25 points first. In order to score points you need to have a six a five and a four because your six is your ship the five is your captain and the four is your crew so once you get a six a five and a four once you get your ship captain a crew then the remaining two dice are going to be totaled up to be your points okay but you can't score any points until you get your ship your captain and your crew and you only have three rolls in total for any given turn to get all five of the dice meaning you need to get a six a five and a four and then the two highest possible dice uh, total. So let's just go ahead and, and run through a couple of rounds here to see what this looks like. So player one, I press the roll button right away on their first turn. They already got their ship, their captain, and their crew. And now they have uh, two more dice remaining, the two and the three. So they have two more rolls here to see if they can get higher than five. I think we could, so we'll go ahead and roll again. And this time it turned out to be exactly a two and a three again. We'll roll a third time. And there we go. So now our third roll was 10. So we see 10 points have been awarded to player one and designated up here on the scoreboard. And now it's player two's turn. All right, so player two will roll. And this time they only got their crew and their ship. So they have two more turns to get a five and two other high uh, numbers here. So we'll go roll again. They didn't get a five yet. So they don't score any points yet. And there we go. Now they got a five and the remaining two dice are only two. That was their third roll. So that's just automatically going to get added. Two points were added to player two. Now it's player one's turn again. Player one will roll and I can move a little bit faster now. That was their third roll. They didn't get a five, so they don't get any points. Now it's player two's turn again. There we go. Now we have 11 here and Given that we only have two dice to actually score, the highest possible we could get is 12. So seeing that we have 11, we do have another roll. We could roll again, but the likelihood of getting uh, two sixes is pretty low. So we're actually just going to keep this score right now. So we'll press keep, and now 11 points have been awarded to player two. That makes their total score of 13, and now it's player one's turn again. So now we can just go ahead. I think you guys hopefully understand the game a little bit more. I'll go ahead and cruise through it a little bit faster here until we get a winner. All right, and we'll go ahead and keep that. All right, no points there. And player one's turn again. Player two's turn. There we go. And now player two wins because they got another eight points, brings their total to 25. And now we can replay the game and it resets everything and goes back to normal here. So that's how we play this game. Uh, that's how this game is actually constructed. So without any further ado, let's actually get into how to create Ship Captain Crew using JavaFX. So one of the first things that I like to do when I'm starting a new project or application, before I even start any other coding, I like to sort of get some sort of sketch or rough draft of what the interface is actually going to be looking like. So one program I like to use for this is called draw.io, draw.io, or it takes you to app.diagrams.net.net. And this is, you can kind of just build like some flow charts in here or wireframe diagrams or like any other type of diagram that you really want. I use it for a little bit of wireframe or like just like I said, an interface uh, sort of design sketch up. So I'm going to start off here with the actual main screen and thinking we'll probably go like 600 by 600 here. So you can just also rearrange this. I'll go 600 by 600. All right. And let me zoom out a little bit so I can get this full width here. So the way I'm going to be designing this sort of interface here is by using a series of stack panes kind of well stacked on top of each other. So at the top, I'm thinking I'll have one stack pane here, and this will probably be about a height of 100, and then the width will just be the full width of it. Now, we're not actually going to see this line here. I'm kind of just doing this for like visually, for visualization purposes. So like I can see in my head kind of what I'm going to be designing when I'm actually uh, designing it out there. And this top one here will kind of just be like this header pane, and it'll just have the title only, and we'll call it uh, ship 
Captain Crew. Maybe give the font a little bit bigger here. Probably go up to like, let's say 24. That looks good. All right, and then I'll probably do another one here. And inside this one, this is gonna be where the scores are. Okay, so let's bring this font back down to like, maybe we'll say 16. Oh, that's not what I wanna do. Let me undo that. And again, we'll bring this font down to like 16 here, as I was saying. And move it over there. Actually, no, I don't even want that font in there in general, because I'm gonna put uh, two random text fields in here. And what this is going to do is it's going to be displaying our actual uh, scores here, our player scores. So I'll say something like player one, and maybe make this about yeah, 100 by 30, sure, that looks good. And we'll just redo that, paste that over here, all right. And highlight both of these and copy and paste them. And this will be the actual score here. We'll just start them off with zero. And then I'm also gonna put in like a little triangle here and I'll, I'll kind of explain what this is in a minute here. Let's let me get this up to size here. We'll go like 20 by 20 maybe. And I'll put this right here and let's style this a little bit. Well, we'll say it's red, why not? So the idea here is that this is gonna be sort of a player indicator to know whose turn it is. So right now we're kind of showing and indicating to the user that it's player one it's player one's turn. And then once their turn is over, it will move over to player two. So then it will just, this thing would come down here. If I can get it to work properly, let me zoom in a bit so I can actually drag it down and show you what that would actually look like. And then once it's player's two turn, player two's turn, this little indicator triangle would automatically go down to player two. And then when their turn is done, this will pop back up to player one. So it just kind of helps visualize whose turn it's supposed to be at any given time. And I think that's all we'll do for that section. Let's go ahead and do another section here. And this one will probably be like our message center, okay? So the idea here is like after player one's turn, if they were to get, let's say seven points, we could say something like plus seven points to player one. That way it just kind of helps, you know, illustrate what's actually happening uh, during, the, during the game. And then let's say like at the end of the game, one player wins, we'll say player two wins. And, you know, just have this little message center going on here. Um, so that's all it for that one. We can do another pane here, and this one might be a little bit bigger here. Uh, this is actually going to be where our dice uh, live at. This pane here is going to be for our dice. And then for our each die, I'll be, we'll say 100 pixels by 100 pixels. Okay. And we're going to need five of them, because that's how you play Ship Captain Crew. So I'll do this a couple more times. Just kind of lay this out here. And copy both of those, paste it over here, drag it over here. There we go. And let's kind of get like some actual, you know, let's actually make it look like a, an actual dice here. And we'll click apply there, make this really small. And we'll just have all of them be sort of just the one. I guess sort of to break up the knotty a little bit, maybe I'll make one of them a two. Here we go. Probably not centered or exactly how it's supposed to be, but that doesn't really matter. Again, this is just sort of our own little prototype, uh, our own little just sketch mock-up here of what we should be aiming for with our UI. So there we go. That works good. And now we have this bottom pane down here is gonna be some of our action buttons, okay? And I was thinking we'll probably have three buttons down here And we'll have one of them over here, make this a little bit more of a normal size. There we go. Could probably look like that. Why not? Get that center, and we'll get two more in here. Get this one centered here, and then one more over here. There we go. Something like that. So this button, we'll call it our roll button. And then this one, we'll say is our play button. And this one over here will be keep. So now let's zoom out a little bit and we can see this whole thing here. So this is kind of what we got going on now. So let me make a few notes over here for us. So over here, we're gonna have our 
header pane. And I said this was 100 pixels tall, okay? And then right below that here, this is gonna be our score pane. All right. And then down here, we can have our message center pane. I'll just call it uh, message pane for now. And then this second one from the bottom is going to be our actual dice pane, where all of our dice live. And then down here, sort of our action button pane, or just the button pane. And this one here is not 100 pixels, but it is going to be 200 pixels. Okay. So that's sort of a rough idea, a rough sketch of, of what we're going to be aiming for here when we're, when we're actually working with our design. And now to kind of go over a few other things that I sort of had in mind here on application initialization on the actual first time setup here, we'll lay out most of this design and this message initially would probably say something like uh, press or maybe even uh, click play to begin. Okay, and then I would imagine that this button, the roll button and the keep button, are both going to be hidden um, when the game first launches up. That way it's very easy to understand that, okay, now we need to press play in order to, well, begin playing. Uh, once we, the user does press play, then I would imagine the play button is hidden, and these two buttons are now visible. Right off the bat, we should keep in mind that the keep button is going to be disabled because the you can't keep right away. You need to first press roll in order to begin the actual game. Okay. Um, and then once the user... I can't get that centered. Oh, well. No big deal. Uh, once the user actually does roll, I would imagine, let's say they roll either their ship, their captain, or their crew. We could probably highlight one of those dice to you know, just sort of visually indicate that the user has gotten their ship, captain, and their crew. And then if they have the ability to keep it, meaning that the only way they could is if they had less than three rolls so far and they had their ship captain and their crew, so then they could keep the two remaining die to uh, dice to you know total their, their, their sum there, to, to total their score. So that's when the keep button would be enabled, okay? Uh, you know what? We should probably also have some sort of visual, visualization to keep track of what role the user is on. So we'll say like, how about over here on this side, maybe in the center there, we could say uh, turn, we'll say one of three, okay? And then after each person's turn, it would go to, you know, it will say turn two of three or turn three of three, so on and so forth. And then once it's the next person's turn, this will back, go back down to uh, turn one of three. And of course, upon roll, uh, each of these would randomize to a different number, one through six. And yeah, I think that's kind of it. I think that's kind of the basic idea of what we're going to be shooting here for on this game. So now that we have a good idea of what we're actually going to be doing, let's go ahead and jump back into the code to actually start this up. All right, so we're going to be creating a new JavaFX project. And in order to do that, we need to have the JavaFX library and all the jars imported into Eclipse already. So if you haven't already done that before, uh, check the description below for a link to another video and blog article I have written and recorded that makes it very easy to add all the required jars that we're going to need into Eclipse. Um, but assuming you have done that, we will just go ahead and create inside of Eclipse here. We're going to go to a new... I'll say project, and then I'm going to click on JavaFX and click on JavaFX project, and I'll click on next, and I'll call this uh, ship captain crew game. All right. Um, for the execution environment JRE, I'm going to click on a project specific JRE, and I'm going to make sure I click on my actual JavaFX one. And I'll even configure the JRE just to make sure that I have all the necessary jars inside of here. So if I edit this one here, and I do not, so that's fine. I can go ahead and still use this one, and I'll show you how to add in the, the different jars and the libraries that we need after. So we'll go ahead and click Next. And then we go over to this side here, and we go to Libraries. And if you followed me along from my previous How to Add JavaFX to Eclipse video, You'll know that we earlier created a user library. So I'm going to go ahead and click on add library here and click on user library. 
and click Next and just select my JavaFX library. And again, this one just has all of the JavaFX required jars necessary. So I'll go ahead and click Finish and I will finish here. All right. And it's going to complain uh, about a little something here, and that's no big deal. I'll just click on this. That's going to complain about a few things. I'll hover over it, and I will say, usually you can just uh, fix project setup. Actually, let me go to the module info here. I'll go to the module info, and there we go. Move class path entry JavaFX to module path. And I do that, and then everything should be handy dandy and fine now. And we got it working just perfect. So let's go ahead and just run this application just now, just to make sure we get our little box here. Which, if you are on a Mac, you might have a little bit of an issue here with the run configuration. I don't know why it does this off the default, to be honest, but it's pretty easy to fix. We'll just go over here and click on Run Configurations. And where is it here? Um... Is it under arguments? Yeah, it's under arguments. These two boxes, just uncheck them. And we will click apply, and now we can click run. And now we should get our little window popping up here. There we go. Here's our application, looks beautiful. I will go ahead and close that and click the run button again, just to make sure that it still works every single time. There we go, and that's awesome, okay. So now we can actually get started with what we wanna do here. So the first thing is I'm going to create a couple little helper functions, all right? So first, I'm going to call this, this is going to be a private void. I'm going to say init layout, okay? And this is going to accept, uh, what is this going to accept? It's going to accept my border pane here, okay? Because this is what I want everything to uh, uh, essentially get onto here. And I copied the wrong thing. I actually wanted to copy that right there, okay? And now from here, I want to initialize each of the individual stack panes. So again, I'm just gonna create a couple of helper methods here. And they're not gonna do anything yet, and we can fix that later. I'm gonna create one, two, three, four, five. And well, why am I creating five? That's because we have five different panes that we need here. We have our header pane, our score pane, our message pane, our dice pane, and our action button pane. So I'm gonna go ahead and say uh, init, we said this is gonna be the header pane header pane, and then in it the score pane, and then we want to in it our message pane, and then in it our dice pane, and finally our button pane. And just breaking these up into their own separate functions just really helps um, sort of organize our code a little bit better, so on and so forth. And now that I have these different helper methods laid out, I'm going to actually call them from our main init layout method. So I'll just say init the header pane and pass in the root border pane. And let's go ahead and copy this a few more times and replace all the rest of the names accordingly. All right, there we go, and then from our start method, we will actually call this one here. And delete that, and end with a semicolon, and now we can save. There we go. All right, so now as I begin to start actually designing and laying out all these different panes and everything else onto our scene, I know what I'm gonna end up having to do is sort of share or reuse a lot of the same variables and, and values and everything else. So instead of just kind of making everything messy and putting everything all inside this big main class here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a separate sort of constants file here. And this is gonna be our sort of our layout constants. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm just gonna create a new class here. And I will just call this uh, layout constants. And I'll make it final. And I'll just go ahead and click on finish here. And now right away, I'm going to create a public static final int. And this is going to be, uh, this is going to be app width, we'll call it. And I'll set this to be 600 because originally I said our whole screen is going to be 600 by 600. So I will change this to height. Okay. And now over here, back in main, I can replace this here and just say dot 
width and height because that is the order that it goes in, right? Um, yep, width and height. Actually, no, I said height there. This should be width. Width. There we go, that's what I was looking for. And do the same thing, but now with the height. Okay. And I can go ahead and save that, go back over into my layout constants. And we're gonna need a few other ones too now. So in addition to the app width and height, we're also gonna wanna keep track of all the different panes uh, all, and all their heights. So I'm gonna say, basically just gonna recreate this here. And this one's going to be our header pane height. And I said this is gonna be 100. And I can copy this a few more times and change this to header. This one will be our score. This one will be our message. This one will be the dice. And this one will be the buttons pane. And then the dice pane, we'll need to get up to 200 there. Okay. So now that I have all these different heights over here, these layout constants, now we can actually begin uh, doing a little bit more of the actual designing here. So let's start off with the header, okay? And remember this header one's really just gonna be the title. It's gonna be very simple. So all I'm gonna be doing here is I'm going to be creating what is called a stack pane. So I'm just gonna come in here and I'm going to say stack pane, pane equals new stack pane. And then I'm probably gonna have to import this into Eclipse here and I'll just make sure I grab it from JavaFX scene layout. All right, and now what I wanna do is I need to specify the height and the width of what my pane is going to be. And I also need to specify where within my application I actually want it to be at. So again, recall uh, the width here is gonna be the entire width of the application and our height is gonna be 100 pixels. And where it's going to be at, well, we can see visually that it's gonna be at the top, but the JavaFX coordinates uh, kind of like grabs that center point as the focal point here. So what we need to specify then is that the, the X position is going to be, well, halfway of, uh, of our actual width here. So, so what I mean by that is if I take the actual center focal point of zero, zero, essentially being right here in the center, well, then I want the horizontal uh, position of that to be exactly at the halfway point. So that'll just be width divided by two. And then the same thing for the Y position, where do I want this to be? Well, I know that my header pane is gonna be 100 pixels. So in order to get this right at the top there, what I really wanna do is make this Y position, well, 100, 100 pixels divided by two to get it again, right in the middle of uh, where we want that there. So let's go ahead and actually code that all up and I'll say pane dot set min width. Nope, not min size, min width. Although min size probably could work too, maybe. I'm not sure actually, but anyways, what I wanna do here is this is going to be our layout constants dot, if I can spell correctly, and this is gonna be the actual app width. And then very similar for the height here. I'll change this to height. And I will change this to height. Okay. And now I want to do pane.setTranslate x. And again, I want to position this in the middle of our application. So I want to say our center is going to sit at width divided by two. And then something pretty similar for the Y axis. It's gonna be set translate Y is going to be our actual, and actually though this is wrong, I'm sorry. This isn't supposed to be uh, app height. This is supposed to be our header height. There we go, that's what I wanted. And then similarly, I want this divided by two which will really just give us 50. So it's gonna put the middle of our Y axis right at the 50 pixel marker, which should put this uh, snugly right at the top of our layout here, okay? 
Um, to just sort of verify this, what I like to do sometimes is kind of just like put colors in here. So in order to put colors, I'm gonna create sort of a rectangle here. And I'm gonna say uh, rectangle, uh, I'll just say box equals um, new rectangle. And I'll probably need to import this in here. And I think I could also just give this some coordinates here. Yeah, that should work. And I'm gonna say box dot, something with fill, uh, set fill. And let's just say this is gonna be color dot red, okay? And now I wanna add this box to the pane. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say uh, pane dot add my box. Nope, I, mean, I need to get the children, I'm sorry. This is gonna be pain dot get children dot add. And now I wanna add the box. And now I need to add this pane to the actual root here. So I'm gonna say root dot get children dot add. And now I wanna add the pane, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and save that and sort of just verify that this header pane looks like a red box right at the top, which kind of looks something just like that there. So let's go ahead and run this application and just sort of test out what we think is happening so far. And there we go, I can see that that is way too big, so I clearly did something wrong. So let's go ahead and see what we did wrong here. Oh, because I set the rectangle itself to 600 by 600, that's why. I don't need that to be uh, 600 by 600. I want this to be the exact same thing as this here. So you know what, maybe I don't even need that actually. It should just autofill the entire width of it, uh, the entire size of it. Nope, okay, I do need to specify an actual width and height. So let's go ahead and just do the exact same width and height of what our pane is going to be itself. And this should work, let's see this here. There we go, that's a little bit more of what I was thinking there, okay? So this is just a temporary thing here. I will remove that in a little bit, but just to keep on going here, now that we have the actual pane set up, now we need to get an actual text box inside of this pane here. So in order to do that, I'm gonna be using a label. So I'll say label, label equals new label, and I can just go ahead and initialize this right away to say our title here, which is gonna be ship captain crew. Okay, and let's go ahead and import this now. There we go, from JavaFX. Okay, and now for the label, what I wanna do is kind of the same thing. I need to specify a height and a width for this label, and I also need to specify an alignment for where it's actually gonna sit within our pane itself. So I'm gonna say label dot, uh, let's see, width uh, should be should be the exact same actually, set, yep, min width, okay. So what I'm really gonna just do here then is copy these two lines, come down here and paste them in, and instead of pane, I'm gonna say the label. All right. And now label dot something with alignment, uh, set alignment, and I'm gonna say position dot center, okay. And now for the label, I wanna set the font a certain size, so uh, font, Label dot set font here. I think that's what I'm looking for. And all I'm gonna do here is just say font dot font of size, we'll say 24. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and save that and try and run this again. And let's see what we're, what we're working with so far. All right, so I don't see the font yet. So what are we missing? Oh, well, of course, I never actually added the label to the actual pane itself. So let's go ahead and add the label now. And this needs to be changed to add all. And I will save that and test this again. And there we go. Now we finally have our header pane all the way up there. But before we move on to the score pane here, I kind of want to refactor this a little bit. Just because I think there's a lot of stuff going on here, it's a little bit noisy and it really only pertains to the header pane itself. So let's go ahead and just encapsulate all of this kind of noisy logic here inside of its own class. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new class over here. And I'm going to name this header pane. 
Okay. And let's see. Uh, header pane, not header pan. And yeah, we'll just go ahead and click finish there. And this is going to actually extend our stack pane class. Okay. And there we go. Imports that. So now I can just pretty much copy and paste all of this stuff right in here. So I'm just going to go ahead and control C that. Come over here, create a public constructor here. And this is going to be called header pane. Not accept any arguments. And I will go ahead and paste all of that in there. I can go ahead and delete that here. And I can also delete all of these and just call the actual methods themselves. Because again, this header pane itself is a stack pane. So all of the stack pane's methods are, well, also the header pane's methods. So I can just do all of that. And that's pretty much it. Very simple class, but again, just sort of isolates um, all of this logic for the header pane in its own simple little class there. So now I can just remove all of this stuff here. And within this little method itself, now I can just say new header pane and boom. Uh, all of that should be the exact same as before now. And let's just go ahead and verify that by rerunning it, and it is. So again, everything's the exact same. It just kind of cleans up my main method a little bit more and puts all the stuff specifically for the header pane inside of the actual header pane class. Let's move on to the actual score pane now. So just to sort of recap here, our score pane is going to look like this second little box right here. We're going to have a couple player labels and their actual scores. We're going to have a little triangle here that indicates whose turn it is. And then over on the right hand side here, we're just going to indicate uh, another label here that specifies who's, or what number turn it is rather. Okay. So to start off, we're going to be doing something very similar. Actually, we're going to create a new stack pane. So I'll say again stack pane pane equals new stack pane okay and let's go ahead and create and again I'm gonna have to import this all right and the reason is because whenever I save I have um, Eclipse will automatically format all the code and optimize all the imports and remove any unused imports and so on and so forth so when we extracted all of this stuff well it effectively removed stack pane then from this class itself because then stack pin was only in this class. So that's why I had to re-import it. In, what why I had to re-import it in here again. But anyways, moving on. So now we need to create uh, or specify the height and width of this pane again. And what I'm actually going to do is just copy and paste this stuff here. I'm really going to copy and paste all of this over here cuz it's going to be very very similar. And now I need to say uh, pane dot though. So I'll go ahead and control C that and control V that a couple times. But instead of the header pane, this is now going to be the score pane. And this is also going to be the score pane. But uh, the minimum width and height will be just like that. But where we want to position this is going to be a little bit differently now. We still. Uh, Horizontally speaking, you want to still center it on the x-axis, but for the y-axis, we actually need to put it a little bit lower because doing just this itself, well, since this score pane is the exact same as the header pane, uh, they're both 100, well, then this would effectively just overlay our score pane directly on top of our header pane, but that's not what we want. We actually want to push it down after the header pane. Uh, does that make sense? We have our header pin here, which goes from 0 to 100. So we need to start this uh, from 100 up to, well, then the width of this, 100 uh, divided by 2. So 150, actually. All right, so what we need to say here is not just 100 divided by 2, which will give us 50. We need to say whatever the height was before of the actual header pin here. So I need to say the header pin plus the our actual midway reference point here okay so set translate y is going to be layout constants header pane plus our score pane height divided by two all right so same thing as before let's go ahead and create a little bit of color in here just so we can kind of visually see where we're at here what our actual pane is going to be looking like so instead of red this time let's make this another color here and we'll say aqua why not Okay, 
And now let's go ahead and add this box to our pane. So I'll say pane.getchildren.add. I don't want to add the box. And now for the root, same thing, get children dot add pane. Okay. And let's go ahead and save that and just sort of run this here and make sure that we have a red box followed by a very similar aqua colored box. Perfect. That's exactly what we want. And again, I'll be removing these colors later. It's just so I can sort of keep track of what the different panes look like and where they're actually centered or, or positioned rather within our application here. So we can go ahead and close that now. Now what we need to do is let's go ahead and start adding some of these labels here. So I'll start with the player one and player two labels themselves. So again, very similarly, I'm just going to be creating a couple other la labels here and I'm just going to Go ahead and sort of copy these, paste them over here, and this one's going to be called player one, and I don't really want the width to be 100 this time, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, 100%, I don't want the width to be the exact full width, because again, remember, we kind of need stuff to like go on the side here, we need something to go over here, whatever else, so because I already made this box here itself, my sort of sketch, the whole reference frame of the number of pixels that we need. This is 600 pixels by 600 pixels. I can kind of just copy exactly what we're doing here. So again, this width here is 100 points by 30 points. So let's just go ahead and, and reuse that same logic over here. So for this width, I'm going to call this one, I'll say 100. And for the height, we said it's going to be 30 and keep the alignment as centered. Let's see what that does. And then the font will bring this down to 16 here. And let's go ahead and save this and let me put these guys at the bottom here. Scoot you all down after. And for the pane, I'm going to now add all here. And now I'm going to add my label. And I'll go ahead and save that and rerun this and just kind of make sure it's in the position that we actually want it to be in. And it's not. It's, it's dead set in the middle here. So let's go ahead and move this over to the side somewhere over here. So in order to do that, we kind of need to set the translate X and Y again, but we're going to be doing it a little bit differently this time because now we, from our zero, zero reference point, we kind of want to move it back a little bit. So we're going to go backwards about, let's say like 200 pixels, and then we're going to go up like maybe 15 pixels here. Okay. So for the label, I'm going to say label dot set translate X, and we'll call that negative 200. And then I'll control C, control V that, change that to a Y. And let's move this up about 15 pixels here. And I'll go ahead and save that. And let's see what that sort of looks like now. There we go, that's a little bit better. And let's go ahead and make our player two label. So let me go ahead and rename this now. I'm going to right click this. I'm going to click on refactor, rename. And I'm just going to name this to uh, player one label. Okay, and then I'm just going to copy this here and paste it down here, change this to a 2, and I know there's a lot of duplicate code here, a lot of uh, hard-coded magic numbers, and we're going to go through and refactor all this a little later, make it very pretty clean code, just like we always should be doing, um, you know, after we get the main logic out there at least, anyways. So now that that's good, uh, the only thing that needs to be different here is that the vertical position needs to be a little bit lower. So instead of negative 15, again, we're kind of like starting at our reference point here of zero, zero. So we're going negative 200 pixels. And instead of going negative 15 to go up, now we kind of need to go down. So we're going to do a uh, positive 15 instead. I hope that coordinate system kind of makes sense uh, a little bit, but let's just go ahead and see what that looks like now. Um, I do need to add this label now to the, oops to the actual paint itself. And I will save that and let's go ahead and run this now. All right, that's looking pretty good. Let's go ahead and add our two score labels over here. All right, so again, in order to do that, I'm just gonna create, might as well actually just go ahead and create them both right off the bat and I'll control C. Control V, and that was player one label. So I'll say player one score label and player two score label. 
And let's replace all of those here. All right, and to start it off, we're gonna put zero here and a score of zero there. Um, the width can stay the same, the height can also stay the same, uh, the, the alignment can stay the same, the font can stay the same, but where we want this to reside is gonna be a little bit different now. Um, so let's go ahead and say, instead of negative 200, and again, we're, we're going from the center point here, so the center point is negative 200, it's gonna be about there. So let's say like 100 pixels uh, more to the right of that. So let's try, we'll say 100 here. And maybe that works out good. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. Let's see, we'll just go ahead and kind of see here. So change that to player one score, change that to player two score. And I'll save this and run this here. And let's see if that's what we're looking for, if we need to tweak it a little bit more. Yeah, that could work, sure. Uh, let's go ahead and actually, maybe we can even move it a little bit closer in. So let's say instead of uh, negative 100, we'll go, uh, let's go like 150 might be too much. Maybe I'll go to 125, but let's just try 150 for now. Let's see what that looks like here. And go ahead and rerun that. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit too close. Let's go with 125. Negative 125, negative 125, control save and rerun. I like that better, that looks a little bit better. Okay, and now let's go ahead and get our number turn over here. So one more label. All right, and we will call this the, uh, let's say turn label, I guess, player, maybe player turn label, player turn label uh nope nope uh actually we want to say uh turn count label let's call it that uh turn count counter label sure yeah naming variables is one of the hardest parts of computer programming so uh we're gonna go ahead and say this is a uh, turn what would we say earlier uh, just turn one of three sure that that works that seems Seems realistic, turn one of three, okay? And this one might be, might need to be a little bit more. No, we still have it at 100 pixels there, or points. And that should be fine, I guess, then. Uh, and now for this time, we want the Y to be zero still for the X, because we want this to actually be like right in the center now. And then for over here, we could, well, let's go ahead and say 100 pixels over to the right side, okay? Uh, let's just go ahead and do 125 since we already have that for the, the Y labels, or for the, the score label, sorry. Um, so we'll say the translate X is going to be 125, and then the translate Y is just going to be set to zero to get it right in the middle of our pane here, okay? And let's go ahead and add this counter label to the actual pane. And go ahead and save that. And now I'll go ahead and run that. Just to make sure this kind of looks normal here. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. And now the one last piece we're missing here is sort of that little triangle, our, our triangle indicator here, okay? So let's stop this here and let's see how we can go and make our actual triangle now. All right, so to do the triangle, we're gonna be creating a polygon, okay? So I'm just gonna say polygon triangle equals new polygon, okay? And let's go ahead and import this in here. And now right off the bat, what I wanna do is, let's just go ahead and make this triangle red. So I'm gonna say uh, triangle.setfill, we'll go with color.red, make it nice and visible. And now in order to create the triangle, we need to actually add points to it. So again, trying to understand the coordinate system. This might get a little bit confusing, but just kind of work with me here. I'll try and explain it as best I can. So now we're gonna say uh, triangle dot something with points. Yep, get points dot add all. And now we're going to create a new array of doubles here. Double, okay. And I wanna preserve this formatting here. So a uh, neat little trick that Eclipse has. I'm gonna do uh, at formatter off here, and then right at the end of this, I wanna say um, at 
formatter and put it back on. And the reason I want to do this is because if I didn't have these on here, let's well, sort of, oops, didn't mean to do that, sorry. Too big, there we go, something like that. Uh, if I didn't have that on there, when I go to control save, um, it's going to kind of, let me hold up here. There we go. Uh, it's going to try and format it in whatever default formatting Eclipse has on there. But when I add these in there, it preserves my white space here, which is what I really want to make it nice and just easier to read. So now if I control save that, it's not going to auto format that stuff in there for me. Okay. But anyways, again, so now what I want to do is uh, I want to create a list of three points here, which is going to specify the actual coordinates of what our triangle is going to be at. So if we go to some sort of online uh, coordinate plotter here, and it might help to understand what I'm trying to do a little bit better here. So I'm going to say a uh, coordinate plane online here. Uh, nope, there we go. Coordinate plane online. Try and get some like online graphing tool here. Okay. So I'll go ahead and delete this here, delete these here. What I want to do here is I want to create one point here which is going to be a five and a zero, okay? And that puts that way over there. Can I move these two? No, I can't, okay. So now I kind of want another point to be like somewhere over here, right? Let's say like negative four, negative four, negative four and negative four. And put it in point notation, there we go. And that's down there. Now let's say a positive four, negative four, okay? Positive four, negative four. And that made that purple. That's not what I want. I wanted, uh, sorry, negative four, positive four, because x axis is first, if you know what you're doing. There we go. Clearly, I didn't know what I was doing. There we go. That's exactly what I want, though. So we could probably use that as our coordinate system. So one point is going to be at negative four, four. Another point is going to be at zero, five. And another point, or sorry, five, zero. And another point is going to be at uh, negative four, negative four. So that's all we do for inside of here then. We just specify our different points. We'll go ahead and say, what did I say exactly? I said, we're gonna have one at five zero. Okay, so I'll say 5.0 uh, and 0, 0.0. We're gonna have another point at negative four, four, and negative four, or negative four, negative four, and negative four, positive four, okay? So now I'll say negative 4.0 and negative 4.0. And I'll have another one at negative 4.0 and positive 4.0, okay? So that's what our point, our triangle is going to look like. So now we have a triangle in that sort of shape there and it's going to be red. Now we need to add it onto our actual uh, pane again here, okay? We need to set the position of where it's going to be at. So we should know pretty easily where our Y is going to be because our Y is going to be uh, either negative 15 to get right in the center of our player one label or positive 15 to get right in the center of our player two label. And then for the X position, we're going to want to put it just a little bit more to the left of where our actual player one label is at. Okay, so maybe we'll say it's like uh, we'll start off with 250, negative 250 and just kind of work it out from there. Okay, so I would just go ahead and copy these two here and come down here and change the name to triangle. All right, and let's go ahead and start this off with a negative uh, 15 for player one and we'll try negative 250. I'll go ahead and save this here. Let's just kind of see where that is visually. Might have to tweak it a little bit again. We'll see. Um, and of course, I forgot to add it to the actual pane here. So let's go ahead and add our triangle. And we'll save that and try it again. There we go. Uh, we probably could benefit to making that a little bit bigger maybe and maybe even pushing it a little bit closer. So first, uh, the easy one, pushing it a little bit closer. Instead of negative 250, um, let's try like negative 230, how about? And we'll go ahead and save that and rerun that. And it should scoot a little bit closer to the label. That's a little bit too close. So let's push it to push it back to 140. All right. 
or 240, sorry. Save and rerun. That looks a lot better, actually. Um, okay. And now let's try and make it a little bit bigger here. If I go back to the coordinate system. Um, so if I kind of just extend them out a little bit, let's say I go back to like negative five here and I would want to match him to make it a little bit symmetrical, negative five there. Um, you know what, maybe we'll even go with a negative six and a negative six. Okay. I'm just kind of run this. How, how big do we actually need to make it here? Um, not too much bigger, really. So I think those extra couple points there should look good. Yeah, let's go ahead and try that. Why not? And instead of negative fours, we'll say uh, that should be at negative six instead. Let's see what that looks like. And go ahead and run that again. Yeah, I like that better. Uh, tiny little detail, you know, maybe you can't even see that uh, from your screen there, but I think it looks good there, okay? Now let's go ahead and close both of those there. Okay, um, so that's mostly it for our score pane, but again, let's go ahead and re... Actually, what we do want to do now, we verified that it looks good for player one. Let's go ahead and verify that it looks good for player two. So I'm going to change this Y position now to 15 pixels. And that should, of course, put that right in line with the player two uh, label now. And it does. Okay. So now let's go ahead and, again, refactor this a little bit here. So in order to do that, I'm going to go over to the right-hand side here. And I'm going to uh, create a new class here. And this is going to be called scoreboard. Okay. Okay. And again, our scoreboard is going to extend our stack pane, just like we did with our header pane class. And I'll save that, and it might auto-import, it might not. It did not, so let's go ahead and import that manually there. There we go. And again, we're going to create a public uh, constructor here. So I'll say public scoreboard all right and now i can again just kind of copy and paste like most pretty much all of this stuff over here almost everything that we need in here is going to be a control c over inside here it's going to be a control v um, anything with the pane i can just delete that because now the pane is the scoreboard itself and remove those there and come down here and remove that. Okay. And I can save that. And let's just go ahead and verify that this still works as ordered. I can just delete that stuff there now. And now I can say uh, new scoreboard. Okay. And this isn't going to be the final state of it, but let's just go ahead and save this right now and make sure that everything still works the exact same as it did before and so far it looks normal okay so we can go ahead and stop that now let's go ahead and do a couple different things here first of all because right off the bat what i'm going to want to do is i'm going to need a way to manipulate this scoreboard from this main class here so instead of just instantiating a new one kind of like what we did with the header pane with the header pane we don't really need to change anything uh, while the application's running. It's kind of a one-time set thing. So that's completely fine that we just sort of, you know, put the instantiation right inside this add method in itself. And now we kind of lose visibility of it. No big deal. We don't need to reference it at any other point within the application's life cycle. But that's not the same for the scoreboard. We're going to have to change the scores. We're going to have to update the little... Um, uh, we need to update our, our counter over here, we need to update our indicator, and we need to update these scores, and so on and so forth. You know, we're going to have to change a lot of state within the scoreboard itself. So let's go ahead and just create a private class of this up here, and I'm going to say private score or private field, sorry. Uh, but I'm going to say private scoreboard, and let's we'll call this our scoreboard. Okay. And now when I uh, initialize the scoreboard pane, I'm just going to say our scoreboard equals a new scoreboard okay and now in here I can just do this all right and I probably spelt something wrong here 
Yes, I did not capitalize there. And there we go. Okay. So now let's do another thing as well. Um, let's make an easy, convenient way for us to be able to switch our uh, player indicator between player one and player two, okay? And if we remember, all we had to do there was change this. So in order to do that, I'm going to, again, kind of what we, like what we did here is we extracted out uh, our scoreboard to sort of keep a different state within our main application. We're gonna extract out this triangle to be able to keep state of where that is. So up here, I'm just going to create another private variable here, private field, and this is going to be a private a polygon and it's going to be called triangle triangle there we go okay and now down here during our constructor I can instantiate the triangle and that's all fine and then I'm gonna create some public methods now I'm gonna say public um, indicate indicate there we go uh, player one turn okay and all this is going to do is it's going to set the triangles translate to negative 15. Oh, and get a return type on that. And then very similar for player two's turn, indicate player two turn, and that's going to be positive 15. And then right when we instantiate our scoreboard, I'll just go ahead and say it's going to be player one's turn to start. Okay. So now if I save this, uh, we should have a red arrow at player one. And I'll go ahead and run this over here. And it's at player one. And now let's go ahead and manually test this when I instantiate a new scoreboard. Now at any other point within our main application, uh, I can just say scoreboard dot indicate player two turn instead. And I'll go ahead and save that and sort of rerun this and now the red arrow should be at player two. And there we go. Now we have a very clean, isolated, easy way to be able to switch and toggle this little red arrow between player one and player two. So now we're getting some real clean coding, real clean refactoring uh, techniques over here. And I think, now that's close to being it. Let's go ahead and refactor a little bit more here because we have a lot of duplicate code here still, a lot of hard coded numbers, so on and so forth, okay? so. Um, I'm not too worried about like this stuff. I guess I could probably do that. Um, we see that these here are almost identical except for the translate Y uh, position here. So let's go ahead and refactor this in itself into its own private class within uh, our main class here, sort of a subclass here, okay? So I'm just gonna say uh, private, we'll call it a uh, player label. And this is going to extend a regular label, okay? And I need to call this a class. There we go. That works a little bit better. Uh, let's see, what should this do now? Uh, we should say uh, public in reference to our scoreboard class, at least. We're gonna call it uh, player label. And this probably is gonna accept a couple, yeah, so we're gonna say this is gonna accept a string uh, label. And then again, the only thing that we actually wanna change between these two labels here is everything's exactly the same except for what the actual label's supposed to be and then it's y offset position okay so we're going to say the label here and then a integer integer of the y offset we'll call that okay and we'll call this super method here with the label okay and then everything else is pretty much going to be exactly a copy and paste so i'll just go ahead and control c all of that come down here and I'll say control V that, but instead of this part here, I'm gonna say the Y offset. And then all of this here, I'm gonna delete all of these here. Just like that. And now really clean, very simple. Instead of uh, this label here, I'm gonna say uh, player label, player one label equals new player one label passing it the player one with the negative 15 y offset okay and that should work 
Why are you complaining here? Player one cannot be resolvable. Oh, sorry. That's supposed to be just player label, not player one label. Okay, cool. And now I can just go ahead and delete all of that there. And I can do the exact same thing for player two, actually. I'm just going to go ahead and control C that, change this to a player two label, change that to player two, and change that to the positive 15. Okay. And again, uh, refactor a little bit, test a little bit, make sure everything still looks the same. I'm going to go ahead and just rerun this and make sure everything still looks normal here. And it does. Okay. So let's go ahead and refactor all these now. What's different between these? They're going to initialize to the same there. Uh, that's all the same. And again, the exact same stuff over here. So um, actually it is the, nope, the, the translate X is going to be a little bit different. So no, I can call it a player score label instead. So almost the same thing. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this here. And instead of player label, we'll call it the player score label. Okay. And we're going to need to change that as well. And with this one, um, yet we want, I'll go ahead and copy all of this here. Replace it with that there. Okay. Delete all of that. All right. And this will go to the Y offset. And I think that's it. Is that it? Is that really all I need there? Um, why, yes it is, okay. So now I can just go ahead and save that, move back up here, and now we're just gonna replace these here. I'm gonna call that, and then give this the, again, negative 15 here, okay? And I can remove all of that and do almost the exact same thing here. And I'll say uh, this one's going to be positive 15. Okay. And again, we have a little bit duplicate code here. So let's go ahead and uh, with these, you know, negative 15 here and negative 15 here. So we'll go ahead and say int um, is going to be player one labels y offset. Long variable name, but it gets the point of crossed. All right. And then almost the exact same thing over here. I'm going to call that two and replace that with that and that and replace that with that and that and change that to that control save that and let's go ahead and run all this again now. There we go. Everything's still looking the same so far. Okay. Um, this scoreboard class itself is going to need a couple more methods, but I think we could probably wait until later to do that. But let's just go ahead and um, put the boilerplate uh, methods down of what they're going to be. So we're going to need a public. Um, it's going to be void. And what's this really going to be called? It's going to be called, I guess, update uh, player one score. Okay. Update player one score and it's going to accept an integer of a score and that's going to do something and we'll go ahead and do the same thing over here player two score and you know what? actually it's not going to be that hard we should be able to just say again we're going to need to be uh need a way to keep this state here of the score labels so i'm going to go ahead and do this Create a couple more private methods. And we'll call this player two score label. And delete that there. Okay. And yeah, um, yeah, I actually I should be able to do that instead. So now I think what it's just gonna be instead is going to be uh player one score label dot set text and we can just call it score and it's probably going to complain uh, that it needs a string instead so I could say uh, integer dot to string and now name it score there we go 
And the same exact thing for player two over here. Change that to two and control save that. And let's just verify that these methods work now. So once I instantiate the scoreboard, I'm going to say uh, scoreboard dot update player one score. And let's say they have 599. And I'll go ahead and save that and run that. Let's make sure this one works. And it does, that's beautiful. And let's go ahead and do the same thing for player two score. And let's say this is uh, 984 for whatever reason. I think our high score is only gonna go up to 50, but uh, you know it doesn't really matter. There we go. Okay, so that works out beautifully. All right, and now let's go ahead and last thing, I think, I hope, with our scoreboard is to also update the turn. So when we say, you know, turn one of three, or turn two of three, or turn three of three, so on and so forth. So I'm gonna, I think I'm kind of just going to copy and paste this exact same thing over here. I'm just going to say update uh, turn indicator, update turn count. Yeah, well, let's call it turn count. Update turn count uh, indicator. Ind no, let's call it counter. There we go. Um, and we'll say this accepts an uh, integer called count. Okay. And then same thing, I think I'm going to have to make this another private label here. All right. And then here I can instantiate it. And down here, I can say, where are you? Where are you? Right here. This is going to be uh, count. And actually, uh, I think we only want the count here. So... Uh, really what it's going to be is uh, string, I'll say text, equals turn space plus count of uh, three. So turn one of three, turn two of three, or turn three of three. And now here I could just uh, say text equals text there. All right, so now let's say it is also scoreboard dot uh, turn counter label. That's not public, is it? I did make that public. Okay, let's change that to private. There we go. Encapsulation. Um, update turn counter. Let's say it is now three. All right, and let's go ahead and run this, and it should say turn three of three now. Beautiful. Okay. I think that's it for the scoreboard pane. All right. So let's go ahead and end this section now and jump on over to the next section, which is going to be our message pane section. The message pane section should be very similar to what our header pane section is. The only difference is, uh, again, we are going to want to keep sort of some reference to our message pane section. That way we can dynamically update the message as necessary. So we can just go ahead here. Um, we might as well actually just copy and paste uh, the header pane section and we'll call it the message pane because again, it's gonna be very similar here. I think instead of a 26 font, we'll probably drop this down to 16 here. And then for this label, we're gonna want a way to sort of uh, keep this label here. So I'm going to go to uh, up here at the top and create a private label and just name it the label. Maybe I'll even name it message since this is the message center here. All right. And now I'll go ahead and first rename this to message. And then take out this type here. There we go. And uh, to start off the game, I think we should probably say, uh, click play to begin okay and I will go ahead and save that and then we're also going to need a another method that's going to be able to update this uh, message here so public void update message with a string of the new message and all we need to say is uh, message dot set text equals message and that should be it, to be honest. Um, except we do need to 
change some of these here. So our height is going to be our message center height. And then kind of same thing like what we did for our scoreboard is we want to put it after the header and after our scoreboard now. So this one here is just going to be this, but then we also need to add in. So let me copy this here, put these in its own parentheses. I'm going to actually uh, put the formatter off right now. So at formatter off, and then turn that back on over here. Now formatter on, because what I want to do now is something like this. I want to say, uh, this plus this and then plus this and what this is going to be is the uh, what's the top one the header pane height and then we need the scoreboard pane height okay there so we want this y translation we want the y offset to be well after the header and after the scoreboard and then we want it half the distance of the actual message pane itself. That way the center of this message pane will be right at the center of well, where we need our message pane to be at. All right, and over here we want this to be our message pane height. Which again, they're both 100, but if we ever change this in the future, uh, just make it a little bit more dynamic for us. And that should actually be it. Let's go ahead and change this color to, uh, let's say like green this time and just sort of verify that this works. And again, we will be removing all these colors later on. This is just for testing purposes right now to make sure that our design works the way that we intend it to work. And that didn't work because I need to come back to the main over here and inside our message pane, in a message pane, we actually need to, well, uh, change it. So, or, or add it in. So we're gonna do something like that. But before we do that, we do need a reference to our message sender. So I'm gonna say a private message pane, uh, and we'll call it message. I like message center back better actually. So we'll call it message center. Okay. And now in here in our init message pane method, we can create a new message center. So we'll say, uh, or we'll instantiate actually, sorry. Our message center is going to equal a new message pane. Okay. And now we can just add our new message center to our root. And now I can go ahead and save that and let's retest it now. And that works good, that looks good, okay. Let's go ahead and make sure our update method works. So I'll go ahead and say uh, message center dot update message. And we can say, uh, let's pretend like player two won. So we'll say player two wins, okay. And we'll go ahead and stop that and rerun it here. There we go. So we know that all works great. And there, that's actually it for the message pane. That was a very simple one. Let's move on to the uh, dice pane here. So in order to create the dice section here, what I'm actually going to be doing is I'm going to be using uh, six different images. I'm going to get, I'm going to create six different images of dice here. And in order to do that, I'm just going to go to canva.com. You can create a free account for Canva and do this exact same thing. It's actually very simple. I use Canva for a lot of different things here. I will say remind me later. All right. And I'll go ahead and create a design here. Let's do a custom size. And I'm going to want this to be 100 pixels by 100 pixels each. So then I'll say create new design. And this should be very simple. I'm going to go over, let's clear all that stuff. Go over to elements and I'm just gonna want a circle. And it should be, let's say like 25 by 25. And for the number one, we'll put that dead center and make it black. All right, uh, I think that looks good. Let's go ahead and duplicate this page here. And now let's make our number two. I'm gonna copy and paste that, move him uh, somewhere up there and then put him kind of space down to the same. Let's make sure that these two are actually dead center. There we go. 
All right, let's go ahead and do the number three now. And now let's grab these three and make sure they are dead center. All right, and let's duplicate it again. All right, so we have our one die, our two die, three, four, five, and six. So now let's go ahead and download all of these, and I will name this dice. All right. And that's all I want there. All right. So now let's go back into our project. And now what we want to do is we want to add these images to our actual game here. All right, so I'm going to click on the source folder. I'm going to right click and type new folder. And I'll just name this images. Okay, and I'm going to go to my downloads folder here. And I'm going to unzip my dice and open this up. And I'm going to grab all six of these and just sort of drag them into this folder here. And copy. Uh, yes. And there, now I should have all six of those images inside of there, okay? So with that out of the way, now let's get on to actually coding up our dice section here. What I want to do now is I want to create an actual die class, and that's going to represent each of these individual die on the screen here. So all these different dice here, uh, each one of them is going to be its own object of a die class, okay? So I'm just going to go right over here and right click. I'm going to say new class. And I'm going to call this, uh, I think I put them in the wrong spot here. Uh, make sure I click on application and now do new class. All right, and just name this die. And we'll go ahead and finish. There we go. So just like we kind of did with some of our other ones, this is going to extend another uh, stack pane. OK. And go ahead and save that, and there we go, auto imports. So now each die is gonna have its own, what's called an image view. And an image view allows you to include an image. So I'll just say uh, image, if I can type, image view, image view, equals new image view. And go ahead and save that, and let's import image view from JavaFX scene image. There we go. So now I just want to create a constructor again, public die. And within here, what we need to do is a couple different things. First off, I'm going to, going to create a rectangle, which is going to sort of be our overall border of how big we want this thing to be. So I'm going to say this is a rectangle, and I'll call it border equals new rectangle of 100 by 100 pixels. And this is going to make me import this here. And just make sure I import it from JavaFX again. All right. And again, I will set alignment to center. And now I want to set the actual image here. All right, so in order to do this, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna say image view dot set image. So first we kind of need to find the image. So we're gonna, well first actually, we're gonna pass in a new image like that. And now we need to actually kind of find the image here. So what we're gonna say is get class, all right, dot get resource as stream and then just pass in where our folder is uh, relative to this location here. So that's just going to be uh, slash images slash, uh, for right now, let's just go ahead and say it's the one.png. All right, uh, it's going to be that file there. All right, and then just to sort of force uh, 
our constraints here. We're gonna say uh, set, I think it's fit height, yep. We'll say set fit width and set fit height. And again, we just want this to be 100 by 100. And let's sort of get a little bit cleaner code in here. And what I'm going to say is this is supposed to be private again. And I'm also gonna create another couple of private ones. I'll say final, actually I'll say private, uh, final static. Uh, and actually maybe I should, I'll, I'll keep it in here for now, uh, but maybe I wanna put this inside layout constants later on, but I don't know if anyone else needs this. Let's see, let's just kind of go with it for now and keep it in here. And I'll call this 100, and I do need to decla uh, declare a data type here. All right, die weight, and we'll do die height is gonna be the same. And now I can just go ahead and replace these here. And that's gonna be the weight, or width, sorry, I said weight. This is supposed to be width, I don't know why I put weight. Uh, width, there we go. Width and height. That looks a little bit better, but I do need to import our actual image from JavaFX again. So let me hover over this, and I want this one here. Again, just always make sure you're clicking, uh, importing the one from JavaFX, and not like Sun or, or anywhere else. And there we go. All right, so now with that, all we need to do now is just add our border and our image view to the actual stack pin here. So I'll just say uh, get children again, dot add all, and we'll add our border and our image view. And go ahead and save that. And now back inside of our main class here, uh, let's just go ahead and put one of them on the board just to sort of see what that looks like right now. So in order to do that, I'm just going to create a new die here. I'll say die, I'll say temp die, so I know to delete it later or replace it or whatever else, equals new die, okay? And now let's just add this to our board somewhere. All right, we'll just say get children dot add, and we'll call it the temp die. And let's just see what that looks like right off the bat here. All right, perfect. So we could do kind of see it in the corner there. Let's uh, change it, its uh, placement a little bit. Well, we'll translate the X and the Y. Uh, set translate X and we'll say, let's put it like kind of at 100 and 100. Just so we can fully see it a little bit better here. There we go. So that's where the die is. So now we kind of want to put this right down here in the middle. You know, we kind of want to create our another stack pane that's going to be holding our actual dice down here. Okay. So we have our uh, individual die. Let's go ahead and create another one, which is going to be our uh, die pane here. Another class that's going to be our die pane. So I'm just going to right click and click on new. And this is going to be a class. And we'll say dice pane. And again, this is also going to extend a stack pane. And I'll say public dice pane. Okay, let's go ahead and save that. And again, we're just gonna kind of copy a lot of the same stuff that we've seen over here before. So I'm just gonna go ahead and control C, move over to our dice pane and control V that. And instead of header, I will say dice, copy and paste that, copy and paste all of that. I actually don't need this here. And let's change this to what color haven't we used yet? Let's use um, something light because we did use green, which is a little bit dark earlier. That was just a little bit hard to see. Um, let's go with ivory. That, that sounds light, huh? Okay. And, all right. Right, so now for the set Y. Uh, let's go ahead and make it look a little bit more like what we did for our, was it our message pane? Yeah, our message pane here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this one. 
and move over here and replace this and same thing we'll say uh, layout constants dot message pane height plus now we want our dice pane height okay and now within our dice pane we could actually add our die kind of like what we did earlier over here so let's go ahead and change this I'm gonna control C that and add that to our actual dice pane and now this is gonna be 100 by one or you know uh, coordinate 100 100 relative to our actual dice pane here and now in here in main instead of adding an actual die we're gonna add our die pane all right so right now I'm just gonna say a uh, new die pane and why didn't it oh dice pane that's why dice pane and that should work okay beautiful so let's go ahead and run this now and just kind of make sure that it looks kind of like what we're thinking it looks like so far and there we go so 100 by 100 was a, a little bit generous there so um oh right because again we're in the center here and we moved it 100 out and 100 down that's why okay so let's go ahead and just put that uh smack dab in the middle then instead and we'll go back to our dice pane and it should just be this by default but let's just you know uh specify it and we'll say zero zero okay there we go um and actually now that uh it has the ivory background with the white dye it is a little bit harder to see so let's go ahead and actually switch the green and the uh ivory here and again we're not keeping these it is just uh sort of help us visualize where these different panes are within our application so and now the message board i should say uh let's change this one to ivory and let's go ahead and rerun this all right that's a little bit easier to see now perfectly ugly um and again we'll we'll remove all these hideous colors later but okay so we have one die now let's work on getting the other ones out there okay so what we're actually going to be doing for this now instead this should have been over here and control save there we go okay so now our dice pane is actually going to hold five different dice images and then they're just going to be dynamically changing their image on their own okay so let's go ahead and just create five different dice then all right so we'll say uh die die one equals new die okay and now this doesn't mean it's going to be the one die it's going to it means it's going to be the die in the first position this will be the die in the second position this will be the die in the third position despite that the actual value on the die it could be one it could be two like it is now it could be three four five or six but the actual variable name is going to be die three because again it's the die in the third position here all right so i you know just hope that uh, ambiguity there isn't sort of uh, mistranslated a little bit okay so uh, die one die two three four and five because our game is going to be played with five different dice and now instead of instantiating all of these to be just the one let's have a way to sort of a be able to change this number but b have a way to sort of change it randomly okay so in order to do that let's go ahead and create uh let's say we have our, our die is going to have its own uh, roll die method. So we'll say uh, public void and we'll call it roll die. Okay. So now what this is going to do is it's going to randomly select a number between one through six, and then it's going to find that image, uh, whatever one it corresponds to. In our case, I labeled our number, our, die, our images rather, just one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is actually going to make it very simple. Um, all right, and then it's going to find whatever number it rolled and then replace the image with that image that the, it's supposed to be the number of, okay? So in order to do this, we're going to create, I'll say, uh, int 
random die equals this is going to be a, a thread local random okay dot current and this is going to be uh, we want to get the next int and we want to specify a range so we're going to say uh, our minimum one and then our maximum which is going to be uh, six plus one okay and just to sort of you know let's get these magic numbers out of here uh, we're going to say uh, final int min equals one because that is the minimum value our die uh, our dice can be and then same thing with six except for max and now I can clean this up a little bit and I'll call this min and I will call this max there all right there we go so now we have a random die value and I'll just go ahead and call this value actually so every time we roll the die we get a random die value and now I want to find the actual image for that so I'm um, really I'm just gonna say uh, string image URI is going to equal pretty much just what this is here instead I'm going to replace this with our random die value okay so let's go ahead and do this here and this is going to be replaced with this and then add our plus again okay and now all we need to do is just copy this here and replace all of this actually just this part here rather uh and actually uh yeah that's fine well we'll just go ahead and, um i do want to change this actually i want to i want to call this file name instead because it's technically not right so let's refactor this and we'll we'll rename this uh image file name image file name because this part here is actually the, the technically the URI. So anyways, um, and I think that should be it. So now let's go ahead and instead of creating our image view with the one, let's just go ahead and roll the die and make it a random one instead. So now it might be one, it might be something different whenever we uh, start our game up now. And there we go, now it's a six. Let's do it again and see if it's a different one. And now it's the one. And let's do one more time. And it's back to a six. Let's do it a third time, or, or a fourth time, I guess, rather. And a five, there we go. Okay, so it uh, should be pretty random, okay? Now let's work on getting more dice out there. So back in our die pane, our dice pane here. Okay. Um, we're not actually using these. So let's go ahead and actually use these instead of sort of our temporary one here. All right. So I do like the fact that it's already in the center. Okay. Um, so let's kind of do a little bit of math here to figure out where these different positions are going to be. So this one here is going to be zero, zero. The X is going to be zero and the Y is going to be zero. For this one over here, so if each die is uh, six, or sorry, 100 pixels, okay? And our entire length here, our entire width rather, is 600 pixels, well then just the space of these alone is already occupying 500 pixels of that. So we only have one more uh, or 100 more pixels to work with between getting this space here, this space here, and all these other spaces here, okay? So since, again, when, I, when we originally made this sort of template here, we made the 600 by 600. So, and each of these are 100 by 100. Uh, points so we can just kind of make some spacers here and see what uh, filling margins we really should be doing here so the width on each side needs to be a width of 30 points as we can see over here and then in between each individual die we want another space of just 10 pixels each okay so each of these spaces is going to be 10 
So if this one, our middle point is at zero, then we're gonna wanna add 50 here, and then we're gonna add, wanna add another 10 here, and then another 50 here, okay? So really the length of one die plus 10. All right, so what we're gonna say then is we want, let's go ahead and make a couple variables here. And I'll say final uh, dice margin equals 10. And again, I need to make sure this is a int dice margin. Okay. Is that how you spell margin? I think I'm spelling it wrong. It looks weird capitalized. Margin. I think that's right. Yeah, okay. Um, and then... Again, we want each uh, uh, die width, which again, yep, okay, so we will want to keep this inside of our constants here because I do want this uh, value of 100 again. And we'll change these to public and save that. Go back over in our die, and now it's complaining because it doesn't know what these are, so. Let's reference it from our constants layout, or our layout constant, sorry. And I'll do a little bit of that, do a little bit of that, and then that, as well as that. And now I can go back into our dice pane. And now I already have what the uh, width is supposed to be. So for our first die, let's go just go ahead and place our die number three right in the middle, because that's gonna be the easiest one to work with here. All right, so we'll say uh, die three dot set translate x. And that's just gonna be right in the middle there. That's gonna be uh, three, okay? And then down here, I'm gonna add die three. And really, I guess it doesn't matter where I put these. I'll say uh, die one, die two, die three, die four, four and die five okay so now for die two is gonna be die two dot set translate x and what this is gonna be is the width of a uh, whole die plus its margin so i'm gonna say uh layout constants dot die width plus the uh, dice margin. Okay. And that's where die two is going to land. And then die one is also going to be this. And actually this should be, be uh, negative. I want these to actually be negative. So I'll, I'll work on that in a minute here. So actually that should be very simple. All I'm going to do is just multiply this by a negative one then. And then same thing for here. I'm going to multiply these by a negative one, but I need to add in uh, essentially this times two here, okay? So now it's gonna be this, and I guess I really could just do times a negative two, okay? Um, for, and this is supposed to be die one, sorry. And now for die four and five, it's gonna be the exact same over here. This is gonna be four and, oops. I need to go this way here. This is supposed to be one. That's supposed to be five. And now these are gonna be the exact same, but I just need to take off the uh, negatives now. And for this one, it needs to be multiplied by two. I think that's what we want here. Let's go ahead and save that. Maybe I did it wrong, but we'll just go ahead and see what it looks like here. I have an error somewhere down here. Okay, uh, add all, that's why. Okay, now let's go ahead and run this. That actually looks pretty darn good and it randomizes all of them right away. All right. So we are gonna have to have a little bit of logic inside of our dice pane, but for now, let's just worry about that a little bit later. Uh, we'll say that the design of our dice pane, at least for the most part, is done. All right, let's move on to the last design section here where we need our actual buttons.
But before we do that, we should actually clean up just a couple more tiny little things quick here. Uh, first off, let's go ahead and remove this temporary die that we created. And I think that should be it for that. But now let's go back into our main. And again, now we kind of want to create an actual reference to this. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and right click this, refactor. Um, I should be able to extract to a local variable here. And I will call this uh, dice, uh, I'll call it dice controller. How about that? Uh, dice controller here. And now I want to move this to a private variable. So I'm just going to go ahead and do a little bit of that. Scroll up to the top here. And I'm going to say private dice pane equals new dice controller. And that should be all I need for that. I'll go ahead and save that again and run this just to, again, make sure that everything still looks normal here. And there we go. Okay. Now with that out of the way, now we can move on to our button pane down here for our last design uh, section. Our button pane is going to be very, very similar to what our message pane actually is. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy and paste this. Instead of message pane, I'm going to say it's our button pane. And let's jump into here now. Instead of a label, we're actually going to need three buttons here. So I'm going to say uh, one button is going to be the roll button. Another one is going to be the play button. And a third one is going to be the keep button. Play button. And keep button. All right. And I will save that. And now let's make sure we import button from JavaFX. OK. So now when we instantiate it, let's go ahead and put our um, our heights in here properly. So this is going to be from the button pane. And just replace anywhere that you see message pane with button pane. And there we go, except I actually don't need the message at all. So I can go ahead and delete those. I'm going to delete this, and I do not need this either. OK, and I don't need that either. Um, but what I will need, and actually, I don't even need this rectangle either. Um, but I do need to add all three. So I'll say roll button, I'll say play button, and I'll say keep button. All right, these haven't been instantiated yet, but I will do that in a minute. Because first, before I forget, I need to put the uh, translate Y position on here properly. So it needs to be after the header pane, needs to be after the score pane, but it also needs to be after the message pane as well as the dice pane. So I'll say message pane and then also our dice pane. There we go. Um, okay, cool. So now let's go ahead and actually instantiate all these. We're going to say a uh, roll button equals new button with a title of roll. And we'll go ahead and do same thing down here. This is going to be play. This is going to be keep. This is going to be play. And this is also going to be keep. All right, uh, let's go ahead and put the positions on here for each of these. So play is going to be smack dab right in the middle. All right, this is going to be at uh, zero, zero in reference to this stack pane, this button pane here, okay, right in the center. Let's say that our roll is also going to be, um, for the Y position, it's also going to be at, uh, uh, sorry, for the X position, it's also going to be at zero, could keep it right in the middle of the width here. But for the Y position, we're going to want to put that, um, let's say, let's see, each button is going to be 100 by 30, I think. Let's go back to our design here, and, and what's this? This is 110 by 40. What would 100 by 30 look like? Because we've done that for our labels and other things before. Um, no, I do like the look of, of it being 40 instead. But what if we even did 50 here? Yeah, nice big old button. Let's do it by 50. We'll say 100 by 50. All right. So for each button, let's go ahead and say uh, roll button dot... What does that size do? Nope. Uh, 
min size is what I want. Okay. Yeah, min size. I should be able to accept both of them there. Cool. Um. Yep. Again, I'm going to create some uh, private variables in here, and I don't think I'm gonna, again. I don't think I'm going to need to move them to constants, but kind of like the dice constants I did earlier, I did end up having to move them. So uh, let's just keep them in here for now. If I need to move them later, we can move them later. No big deal. Uh, we'll we will say this is going to be an int, and this is going to be the button uh, width is what we say it was going to be 100, I believe, and then. The height was going to be 50. All right. And now with this, we're just going to say uh, button width and button height. And let's go ahead and repeat this a couple more times here. And change this to our play button, change this to our keep button. All right, so now we want to position them uh, a little bit over. So I would say for this, we could probably put like 50, uh, 50 pixels of margin here. So we'll say uh, final int button margin. We'll say this also equals 50, okay? So now with this one, we want our roll button to be probably the width of a whole button plus 50. And again, this is going to be uh, to the left, so it's got to be negative. All right. So we'll say roll button dot set x. All right. And this is going to be whatever this is times negative one. And whatever this is is going to be, again, our button width plus our button margin. And then same thing with the keep button, except that it's gonna be to the right. So we want that to be positive and not negative. Um, let's go ahead and save that and now go back into our main and let's make sure that we actually create our, our button paint here. And we are gonna need some state for that inside of here. So I'll say this is our uh, button pane. There's going to be a new button pane. And we'll add this down here. And then we'll inform this main class what a button pane actually is. So we'll go ahead and say private button pane is going to be called a button pane. And that should get rid of those errors there. I will save that and run this here. And let's see what that looks like now. Oh, right, I did not, okay, yep. I put set layout x and not set translate x, that's why. It's supposed to be set translate x, not layout x. My apologies there. And now let's see that again here. Let me go ahead and run this again. That looks a little bit better. Okay, so now we have roll, play, and keep, okay? So now within our button pane, we're gonna want a few other methods here. Uh, again, we're gonna want a way to sort of hide these buttons. So let's create a couple um, public methods here. This would be a public void hide roll button. Okay. We're also gonna want a hide our play button and then a third one to hide our key button. And then we're gonna want actually a fourth and a fifth one to enable and disable. Um, and actually maybe I'll just create one and um, we'll say set, well, yeah, let's say uh, keep button set enabled. All right, so Boolean is enabled. And we'll just say uh, keep button dot, we should have an enabled button uh, method here. And we'll have to look up what that is later. So I guess for now, we will just, yeah, disabled property. Maybe it's that, maybe it's disabled.
Yes, set disable. Okay. So actually, let's go ahead and uh, keep button set disabled instead. Let's call it disable. And we'll say is disabled instead. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little annoyed with that API, I guess, that comes from JavaFX. I, I would rather set it to be the positive, the affirmative, instead of trying to set it to the negative, just kind of, I don't know, that's how my brain works, I don't know. Um, let's go ahead and just kind of see what that looks like right now, just to sort of make sure that I have it uh, in my head properly. So in our main, when we start our application, uh, let's just go ahead and say, you know, I'm gonna actually also create a sort of reset method here. Uh, so let's just go ahead and do that now. So I'm gonna say uh, private void reset, I'll say reset game, all right? And it's gonna do a lot of different things like, you know, resetting the, the scoreboard counts back to zero, um, and, and like a whole bunch of other things. But right off the bat, when we also reset the game, what we also want to do is disable our keep button. Um, and actually, yeah, when, when we play the game, yeah, yeah, when we, we play the game. So reset game. Okay. So we're going to say a uh, button pane dot, uh, what do we call that? Um, keep button set disable and I should actually rename this to keep uh, or set keep button disable let's do that so that sounds a little bit better I'm gonna refactor this here rename and I want to say this uh, set keep button disable okay and go back over into main and we will say so set this to disable uh let's say true because when we reset the game we want the keep button to be disabled all right and let's go ahead and run this and let's just see if that works in itself um it's not going to because i never called the uh reset game method all right so once we do all that uh once we initialize all the layout now let's just reset the game and just start with a, a clean slate here. All right, and let's see what that looks like now. Perfect, that's actually exactly what we want. Um, kind of, at least. We, we want that functionality of the button, because uh, realistically, when we start the game right off the bat, we want this to actually be hidden. So let's work on that next, okay? Uh, so when we reset the game, we actually don't want that. Um, I mean, we will later, but let's change that for now. Let's go back into our button pane and let's find a way to hide all these different buttons now. And actually, if we have a hide method, we're also going to want a show method. So maybe there's a uh, visible. So we'll say uh, roll button dot visible uh, set visible. Perfect. Yep. So actually let's go ahead and do that instead so we'll rename this to say uh set roll button visible and this is going to accept a boolean called is visible is visible there we go and set visible is just going to be is visible all right and i can actually just go ahead and do the same thing down here, but instead of the roll button, now we want this to be a play button, and we want this to be the keep button. We want this one to be the play button, and we want this one to be the keep button. There we go. Um, okay, so now let's go ahead and test all of these. I will go back into main, and when we reset the game, let's just say all of them are hidden. All of them are set to uh, visible false here. So we're gonna say, uh, button pane dot set keep button visible false do this a couple more times and because we actually want this to be the roll button and then the play button and then the keep button so now let's go ahead and save that and just verify that this works here and now all three of our buttons should be hidden okay beautiful Let's go ahead and close this. We'll say visible, actually. Is it visable or visable? I feel so silly right now. Um, 
button pane dot set visible. Okay. So I need to rename these three over here before I do anything else. Let's go back over here. Uh, right click, refactor, rename. This is going to be a ibble. There we go. Okay. Um, right. So now when we reset the game here, uh, let's just say this is true to start. Okay. And we'll press play. There we go. Okay. So realistically, this should be a game ends sort of thing where we, you know, player two wins, hide this, hide this, uh, show this. And then once we actually start the game, we should hide this and show this and show this, but disable this. So let's go ahead and do that. Actually, we will say a button or we'll create inside of our main, we'll create a start game method, which is going to do that. So... We'll see. Start game. Okay. And that will put this to true. We want our roll button to be true. We want our play button to be false. And then we want our keep button to be true. But we want our keep button to be uh, set keep button disable to be true. We want to disable this button. Okay. So now. Let's, uh, yeah, let's go one step further here. Um, when we press the play button, we want to start the game, right? So we need to capture a way then to say when the start button is pressed, we need to call the start game method here, okay? So actually, this should be inside of our, uh, inside of our, pr uh, our button pane class itself. So let's go ahead inside here and we're going to create this and call it all of these here. Okay. There we go. And now we need to uh, figure out some way of capturing when our play button was clicked here. So in order to do that, let's go over to the documentation here. And I'm just on the docs, Oracle, JavaFX, how to use the UI controls for button. And it says, hey, assign in an action. Uh, pretty much just copy this code here. All right, let's go ahead and copy that. And I will come down here and I'll show you what that is in a minute here. But now I'm going to paste that down here. And let's go ahead and say uh, private or, well, let's go ahead and just do that right inside the constructor. Why not? And I will say uh, for our play button, this is going to be our play button and set action here. Let's go ahead and do this now. I'm going to extract this out into its own thing here. So refactor, extract method. And this is going to be um, on play button. Okay, on play button action, why not? We'll call it that. And let's rename play button action because I misspelled that there, a little typo in there. There we go. And now I need to add all this stuff in here. And this is gonna be coming from Nope, that's what we want. JavaFX handler. Okay. That's why it imported that automatically for me. Okay, let's go ahead and change this now. And now it should want to import what I want right away. So I'll highlight over here. And I want to import from JavaFX, there we go. That makes it a little bit easier. I also wanna import an action event from JavaFX. And perfect, and now let's just, uh, 
let's just test that this works right off the bat. And I'm going to say system.out.println uh, play button clicked. OK. So let's go ahead and run this now. Let's see. That's fine. That doesn't matter. I guess we could if we really want to be super picky about it. There we go. And let's go ahead and run this. And now, down here in our console, when I click this, we should see play button clicked. If I click it a whole bunch of times, we should see play button clicked. So that works beautifully. Now let's go ahead and change this to what we actually want. So when the play button is clicked, what we want to do is start the game. Okay. And I'll just say uh, start game. So that should work for that. And I'll go ahead and rerun this again. And there we go. That's exactly what we want there. But when we do start the game, we now need a way to sort of inform our main class that the game has started. So how could we do this? So one way we could do this is by essentially just moving this functionality back into our main controller class itself anyways. So that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to move this from here over to in here. All right. And now what I need to do is a couple other things here. When I initialize the button pane, I'm also going to need a way to register this play action uh, on play button action with the actual uh, action method for the play button. So what I'm going to say is something like a button pane dot set. Let's see here. What what do we what does the API itself call it? Um, set on action. So I'm going to want a public void uh, set play button on action. All right. And this is going to accept this here. And we will call it this here. And all we're going to do is just like this. Okay. There. And I should be able to delete this now, and I should be able to delete this now, and I should be able to call this from over here. And should just be this here. Just like that. And now let's go ahead and move the start game method back over into the main controller. Okay. And I will do that. And this now also, each of these need to reference the button pane again. So let's go ahead and do that. And now at the end of here, I want to say uh, dot out, not nano time, dot out dot print line. And we want to say starting game inside main controller. And I'll go ahead and save that. And let's go ahead and run this now. Let's just see if all this stuff still works normally here. And I will play. There we go, starting game, and I'm now inside the main controller. So I think that works fine. I kind of would have liked to keep all the logic uh, for handling buttons and everything else inside of the button pane, but just because this is sort of like the main controller, it makes sense to sort of keep the action buttons inside of here because we're gonna have to manipulate a lot of other things in here based off the state of what happens inside these actual different buttons within the button pane itself. So that's fine. Let's go ahead and create a couple more uh, actions for our roll and our uh, play button, or for our key button, sorry. 
So this one will be our roll button. And this one down here will be our keep button. All right, and for this, we'll fix this later. We'll just say uh, roll button clicked. Okay. Down here, we're going to say keep button clicked. And our play button is already handled for us, luckily. So um, I can go ahead and remove that. Uh, what we do need to do is register each of these. So where did I do that at? Um, yes, right here. OK. Let's go ahead and do that a couple more times. For this one, we want this to be our roll button. It's going to complain because we haven't created those methods yet. That's fine. I'll say roll button there. I'll say keep button there. And now let's go into our button pane. And we will just copy this a few more times. And we'll say roll button here. We will say keep button here. And roll button, keep button, and how about we just say on button action for all these. Make it nice and simple. Okay. And that should be good there. Let's go ahead and run this again. So now when we play it, we should do that. I should be able to see roll button uh, clicked anytime I do that. I can't do the keep button yet, so let's go ahead and, uh, for instance, let's just say for right now, when the roll button is clicked, let's go ahead and, uh, let's see. When the roll button is clicked, let's go ahead and enable the keep button. That's Again, that's not what we want to do yet, but for the purposes of testing, let's just go ahead and say uh, keep button set keep button disable false. Yep. So we want to uh, set the disabled property to false, meaning that we want to enable it again. All right. So let's go ahead and run this now and just verify that our action button inside of the main class works for the keep button. So player clearly works, role clearly works, and now keep button works also. Perfect. All right, that's exactly what we want. All right, so let's move over to the actual roll button now. So what we really want to be happening here is when the user presses on the roll button, to start off with, let's just assume that we're gonna roll all dice every single time, no matter what, because realistically that's gonna be what we want uh, to happen on the first turn anyways. When we roll the dice, we need to be, uh, we need a way to roll all of these, okay? So I would imagine we would want the dice controller to handle that, our dice pane to handle that. So let's create a new public method in here. We will call this uh, public void, let's say it's roll dice. And again, to start off, we're just going to um, create all, uh, roll all dice to a new random number. Okay. So what we could do is we could create, this is actually, these are all supposed to be private again. Now that I'm here, let's go ahead and change these to private. And now what I also want to do is I want to create a, a private, I'll say list of die and I'll say all dice equals new or I could say arrays dot as list. I could say die one die two, die three, die four, and die five. And I'm gonna have to import the list interface. And there we go, okay. And the reason I wanted to do that is because now I can say uh, for die, die in all dice, what I wanna do is die dot roll die, okay. So let's go ahead and save that. And now 
from our main controller, when we click on the roll button, we want to say uh, dice controller dot roll dice. All right, and let's go ahead and test this out now. So we will click on play and roll dice. And we can see every time we press it now, we get randomized dice every single time. Um, now that we're here, actually, now that we're actually starting to work on the actual logic of the game, how about we can now go ahead and remove all these different colors here. We have the full design set of what we want, so now we can just remove all these colors because they're starting to get a little bit annoying for me now. So let's go ahead in our button pane. We actually don't have any color there. In our dice pane, let's go ahead and remove this box here. And then, yep, remove that from there. Okay, we'll save that. From our header pane, let's go ahead and get rid of this box here. Get rid of that one there. Um, from our message pane, remove this box. Remove this. All right. And then last but not least, our scoreboard. Where is the box here? And then that means it must be somewhere up here. Here it is, okay. Perfect. Let's go ahead and rerun this again now and let's just see what this looks like. Oh, beautiful. Um, except that is a little bit dark. It actually might benefit from keeping maybe like a, a little bit darker of a shade on here. Let's go ahead and try that actually. Let's say yeah, maybe I'll keep like a dark border up on the top and then um, maybe like a little bit lighter of a shade for the actual dice. That wouldn't be bad. Let's see, our header pane. I'll just control Z a couple times here. But instead of red, let's make this like a dark gray. Is there like a gray button? Oh, we got gray here. Dark gray. Yeah, let's go with dark gray. Let's see what that looks like here. Okay. And then for the dice pane, let's go ahead and control Z again a couple times. And for this one, let's just call this regular gray. How about that? Let's see what that looks like. Let's see if that's not too ugly there. Oh, interesting, I, I would have figured, okay, they seem a little bit backwards for whatever. <laughs> this dark gray is actually uh, really dark gray, but the other gray is a little bit lighter. So let's go ahead and switch these then, I guess. Um, we'll call this, and you know what, let's just say actually RGB. I like doing RGB myself anyway. So if you're not familiar with RGB, then you can just use one of the preset colors like gray or dark gray or whatever you really want. Uh, for me, I know the RGB value, so I'm gonna create this one to be a little bit lighter for gray. Um, Let's call this one like, I'll say 200 by 200 and then 200. And then for the other one, I want it to be a little bit darker. I'll probably just cut that in half and say uh, 100 each. So let's go over here and instead of this, I will say this is, oops, okay. Uh, color dot RGB. And we'll say actually, let's go like that 150, 150, 150. Make it a little bit darker than that. Let's see what that looks like here. And I'll go ahead and uh, play this again, run this again. There, I like that a little bit more. I, I think that's uh, a little bit easier to see now. Okay. And now we can play, and now we can roll them every time. Okay. Um, one thing to note, now that we have... We, we do need to continue on with the roll logic a little bit more, but let's go ahead and fix our scoreboard and our message pane on the start since we, we're kind of like almost finished with the main start method anyways. Let's just go ahead and, and finish it all the way up. So we'll go back into main. Uh, we should have a start game method here. So when we do start the game, actually let's also take out um, some of the testing stuff we did first. So in the scoreboard, we want it to say turn one of three. All right, I think at some point we did, we were doing our testing. Maybe it's in main when we instantiated our, our scoreboard here. Yeah, we did all of this stuff. So let's take out all of this right away, okay? And let's also take out this right away. 
And actually, that should all be all we need. Let's, let's go ahead and press play now. Let's see what that looks like here. That looks a little bit better. Click play to begin. So when we do click play, though, we're going to want to remove this message here. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, back inside main, when we... I'll probably end up removing this. Uh, we'll see, though. Let's just keep on moving along for now. When we start the game, we do all this stuff. And then in our message center, message center dot update message. And let's just remove it for now. We'll, we'll set it to an empty string here. Okay. There we go. So now when we click play, it should do that. And then we should, the only thing we can do is click our roll button. So we click roll and it does this. Now let's work on the logic where we want to detect any time a person rolls, we want to increment the turn to the next turn number. And then we want to sort of like lock in whether the user has gotten their ship captain or crew. So like in this case, our first die is a five. So we already know they got their ship. So we want to indicate somehow that the person has their ship and, or sorry, their, their captain. I apologize. The five is the captain. Uh, so they got their captain and they also got their crew. So we want to sort of lock these in here and we want to sort of show some visualization to, for the user to know that they, they got those both locked in. So I'm thinking we could probably do some like a red border around these. And that way, now when they press roll again, these two wouldn't roll, but these three should. All right, so let's kind of work on all of that stuff next. I think the easier one to handle would be uh, the handling the turns first. So let's increment this uh, up to two and then the three. And then once it's player, th uh, then once it's the third roll, we should change the player and reset this back to one. So let's kind of work on that logic of it next, okay? So inside of our main uh, controller here, we're probably gonna need some way to keep track of what turn it actually is. So we'll say this is a private int uh, turn counter, and we'll initialize it to one. So now every time that the roll button is clicked, we're essentially gonna, just gonna update this counter. So we'll say uh, turn counter, counter uh, plus plus okay so now if turn counter is greater or we'll say is equal to three actually what should this logic be here um so it starts off at one and then they roll and now it's two so yeah we'll say if it's greater than three so if it's greater than three meaning if it becomes four well now we need to say turn counter equals one reset it back to one and then change players. We'll just go ahead and say change players, okay? So now down here, I'll make a private void change players method. And then in order to do that, I'm gonna need some way to keep track of what player's uh, turn it is. So I'll say private, um, how can we do this? Uh, let's just say private int and we'll say uh, player turn equals one. We'll start off with player one and then come back down to where we were here, change players. So if player turn is equal to one, change to player two, player turn equals two. In order to indicate that, we are going to change our scoreboard to indicate it's player two's turn. So scoreboard dot Let's see, indicate player two turn. All right. And then the only other way it could be, or the only other option it would be is uh, if it equals two. So now we'll just say it's player one's turn. So we pretty much just reverse this logic here. So player one and player one. All right. And let's just test this out now. And let's see what this looks like here. All right, so we start the game. All right, we uh, player one rolls once. Ooh, we did not update the uh, number there. So when we roll, we also need to update the turn counter. All right. And that's going to be on the scoreboard. So scoreboard dot update turn counter to be our turn counter. OK, let's go ahead and do that. And we should only want to do that 
after this part here. Okay. Yep. There we go. That should work. Let's go ahead and save that, and now let's run it. So we'll go ahead and run this here. All right, so we'll play. And, okay, so this is our first roll. So right now it's turn one. There we go. Now it's turn two, so we roll again. All right, now this will be turn three, and we'll roll again. And there we go. Now it's player's two turn. Now it's player two's turn, and it's their first turn, so they can roll. And they can roll again. And now this is going to be their third roll. They roll again, and now it's back to player one's turn. And now it's their turn. Okay, so that seems to work all fine. Okay, now let's work on the logic of actually locking the different dice here. Okay. To work on the actual locking mechanism and, and the validation of what dice are are found or, or whatever else, you know, if they got their, their ship, their captain, or their crew, we're going to be working mostly in this dice pane, I believe. Okay? So, first, let's kind of just work on the visualization of what it's going to look like when a dice has been uh, sort of locked, right? Sort of found. If, if it's a ship, a captain, or a crew, we kind of want to indicate that. So, like I was saying earlier, uh, we kind of want to show this by like some red border around the dice, okay? So, let's just say when we roll the dice the first time, let's go ahead and say, let's like, for whatever reason, die three has a red border around it, okay? So one way we could do this, I believe, is by saying, um, let's see, how would we do that? We can actually do that with the border itself, on the die itself. So let's go ahead and create, let's move this to be a private method here, or private variable field, sorry. Okay. And now let's create some sort of like lock uh, method here. So we'll say public void lock, okay? And then we're, I'm sure we would want some sort of unlock method for this as well also. So unlock. And then let's go ahead and create a public Boolean is locked as well. That might come in handy as well. And then in order for an is locked, we would need a private, um, Locked equals right away. It's going to be set to false. And now return locked. Okay. Oh, I didn't put a data type on here. Boolean. There we go. Okay. So if it's locked, we first want to say uh, locked equals true. If it's unlocked, we want to say locked equals false. Okay, and now if it's locked, let's go ahead and set this border. So we could say border dot, uh, I believe it's stroke. We could say uh, set stroke, I believe. Yeah, we'll say set stroke is going to be uh, color dot red. And actually, let's just go ahead and set the color uh, red to red right away. We'll go ahead and on a stand sheet or on, on, in the constructor, we'll go ahead and set the stroke to red, but we'll also set the width, uh, set stroke width to zero. Okay. And now when we lock it, all we need to do is just change it from zero to two. And then when we unlock it, let's go ahead and set it back to zero again. Okay. And now back inside our dice pane, like I said, let's just go ahead and lock the third die. die. All right, just for testing purposes. Okay, let's go ahead and just see what that looks like now. So when we play, we'll roll, and then the third die is now locked. Let's make that a little bit bigger, actually. Let's change it up to like... Um, well, let's say four. Well, let's move the border stroke, the, the stroke width to like four instead of two. That's a little bit hard to see. Change it up to four. Let's see what that looks like here. There, that's a lot easier to see. Okay. 
So we know the actual locking mechanism works, but at least in terms of uh, visualizing it, because now let's change the fact that once it is locked, well, we still can roll the die, and that's not what we want. So when we roll the dice, we don't want to do it uh, for all of them here. We only want to do it for the ones that are not locked. So if die is locked, if it's not locked, then we can roll the die, okay? Let's go ahead and change that. And we'll save it. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like now. And um, we'll run this again. So if the die is not locked, then roll that die. So now that it should lock this third one. And now the third one should never change ever again for the rest of its lifetime, okay? And that's all great. That seems to work just fine. Um, let's kind of handle the instance where we need to unlock it. So after... So back in our main controller, after it's the next person's turn, we should need we should have some sort of way that's going to unlock all the dice here. Okay, so I would imagine we would want some sort of uh, method in here that says unlock all dice public void unlock all dice, and then the same thing. We'll just, just get this a uh, for loop here, and we'll just say uh, die dot unlock doesn't matter if it's locked or unlocked already, we just want to unlock all the die. And unlock, that's not what I named it, did I? Did I typo that? I sure did. All right, let's go ahead and rename that here. Refactor, rename, unlock. There we go. That looks a little bit more normal. All right, let's go ahead and run this again here. And we'll play, we'll roll, roll a second time, roll a third time. And there we go, now it's the next person's turn, it's player's two's turn, and we'll say roll again. So that should have unlocked that die there, and it didn't. Oh, actually it did, it's just that um, it's always going to set to lock the third die. So that actually did work, it just uh, appeared that it didn't. So let's go ahead and work on the logic now. At least I'm assuming it worked. Uh, let's go ahead and work on the logic now, where we only lock a die if it's a ship, a captain, or a crew. That way we can sort of verify that that did in fact work. So um, that was back in our dice pane, I believe. Yep, I just said uh, die three lock. That's not exactly what we want, though. We want only want to lock it if it's a ship, a captain, or a crew. Now, we should understand that we're only going to lock it if it's a ship, a captain, or a crew, and we don't already previously have a ship, a captain, or a crew. So inside of our dice pane here, our dice controller, we will probably want some sort of way of annotating that we have a ship or have a captain or have a crew. So I'll say uh, private boolean has ship, and we'll set this to false right away. We'll do this a couple more times here. Has ship, has captain. And we'll say has crew. Okay. Now let's go ahead and actually use these here. So roll the die. All right. If the die dot, we don't have any way of verifying what value this is, do we? Um, nope. Okay. So let's go ahead and work on that. Because now we need a uh, way for each die to let our dice controller know what its value is. Okay. So... I don't even have a way of storing that anyway. So we need this die to store a value, okay? So we'll say a private integer, and that's gonna be die value, okay? And then right off the bat, we're just gonna say, uh, we do roll the die. So now we're gonna say, yep, random die value. So really what I could just say is our die value itself. Our die value equals that. And now we could replace that. And now we want another public method here. Public integer of get 
value. We'll just say that, all right? And this is just gonna return our die value, okay? Now back inside our dice pane, we can say if the value is equal to a six, we will say has ship equals true, all right? Else if die dot get value is equal to a five, we'll say uh, has captain equals true. And then again, a else if die dot get value is equal to a four, well then has crew equals true. Okay. Um, but that's not exactly true because if it's a six and we don't already have a ship, okay? So if it's a six and we don't have a ship, well then it equals true and lock the die. Okay? Else if it's a five and we don't have the captain already, has captain, well, then that equals our captain, and we can say die dot lock. Oops. Die dot lock. And then same thing. If it's a four and we don't have the crew, well, then has crew equals true, and again, die dot lock. Okay? Else, we don't care what it is. All right. Now let's go ahead and save that, and let's just kind of see where we're at now with this. All right, so we'll go ahead and play, and we'll roll. And look at that, we got our ship captain and our crew right on the first try. So now our score is six, and this is our second turn, so we'll go ahead and roll again. And now our score is seven, and we would roll again. So. So it's still not working exactly here because at the end of our turn, did I call the unlock all dice method? I don't believe I did actually. Maybe that's why it's not working. Um, change players, no, I did not, okay. So once we change the players, then we need to go back to our dice pane, our dice controller, and we need to say unlock all dice. And actually, I don't even need to do that. I can just do it right there. Because it doesn't matter whose turn it is. We need to unlock all dice no matter what. Once we change players. Okay? So let's go ahead and try and run that again. And let's see if that works now. Alright. So here's our first roll. Here's our second roll. Here's our third roll. Okay. And there we go. Um, so now here's our first roll. And we also need to reset all of the um, the has change stuff as well. Uh, or has ship, has captain, has crew, sorry. So once we do change players, then we also need to reset all that stuff. So once we unlock all the dice, I think it would also be a good chance to just say these all equal false again. So let's just go ahead and copy all these. Uh, so when we unlock it, uh, after we unlock all of them, we also need to say, uh, reset these back to false, okay? And, right, let's try that. Let's see if that works here. All right, so roll one, roll two, there we go, roll three. All right, roll one, Roll two, roll three, all right. Roll one, roll two, roll three. So kind of one thing that we don't, that I don't like about this though, is it's a little bit hard to, um, once that player does a third turn, so like this is roll one, all right. Now it's roll two, now it's roll three. We did kind of lose that highlight there. Even though it's now players one turn to do their first roll, 
uh, we, we kind of should get that s sort of visualization still that, well, we still have these three because this was still player two's third turn. Now we roll, and this was player one's first turn, and now we're going to roll a second time, right? So let's change up the logic a little bit to instead of right now it's going to be our third roll, we don't want to remove those right away. We only want to do, we only want to remove all that stuff once player one does their first, once the next player does their first roll. So let's see how we can change up our logic a little bit to show that instead. So I think the only thing we actually needed to change is just when we actually unlock the dice. So we don't want to do it right when we change the players inside of our main uh, class here, when we change players. I don't think we want to do it right at the end of when we change players. I think we actually should do this at the start of the first roll. So let's go ahead and take this out here and let's put this inside of our roll method. All right. So before we do anything else, we can actually just remove this print line statement now. I think before we do anything else, uh, really what we should do is first check if the turn counter is equal to one. If it's the first turn, well, then let's just unlock all dice. That way, at the end of the third turn, we kind of still see if the uh, previous player had the ship, the captain, or the crew. And they can see their score. It just helps visualize things a little bit better. So let's go ahead and run this now and see what this looks like. All right, so we'll go ahead and play, and then we'll roll. And we didn't get any of them. Now we got all of them. And let's roll again. And there we go. So now that was the third turn. All right, so now we're supposed to be working on turn one of three. And we can see that the previous player got that. So I think now would be a good time to... Uh, now, before we do that, I was going to say now might be a good time to work on the point system, but let's actually work on this keep button here because this keep button is going to enable us to actually keep our points or score up our points or whatever else. So let's work on this keep button because we can see now on the first turn, nope, it doesn't even do that. Uh, on the first initialization of the game, on, on the first startup of the game, when we play... The key button is disabled, and I think we hard-coded in this roll button here to just enable it right off the start. But that's not really what we want. What we really want is once the user has their ship, their captain, and their crew, then they should get this key button enabled here. So let's work on that. So now, on the roll, we go in and we roll all the dice. Um... So now, once we roll the dice, we should check if the user has ship, captain, or crew. But only if it's not their third turn yet, right? So let's do it after this part here. Um, update the turn scoreboard. Yep, that's fine. So now let's go ahead and now we're going to check if they have ship, captain, or crew. So I would imagine we would want our dice controller to sort of handle that. So we could probably say something like if dice controller dot has ship captain crew and we'll work on that method in a minute well then if they do have that then we should enable our button so we'll say button pane dot keep button uh so set to disable false okay else if they don't have it then set it to true all right. And now wherever this other method is, um, where did we set that initially? I thought it was on the first roll that it was set. Yes, right here, right in front of my face. Okay, so we can just go ahead and delete that now. And now let's work on creating this actual method here. So let's go into our dice pane, our dice controller here. Let's create a new public method. We'll say public, this is going to return a Boolean. It's going to return true or false. And all this is, is going to return has ship and has captain and has crew. And it is simple as that. Should be as simple as that. Let's go ahead and test this now. All right, so now our key button should only be enabled once we have the ship, the captain, and the crew. So we go ahead and roll, 
and we don't have it yet. There, now we have it, and now we can uh, keep it. And we'll go again, and we could still keep it, although realistically, um, you can't really... No matter what, you're going to end up keeping this score now, because now this was the third turn, um, and now we're working on the player two's first turn, right? So realistically, on the third roll, this keep button should be disabled again. So let's go ahead and try that then. So... Where did we do all that? We're in the dice pane here. I think I didn't want to be in the main controller again still. Okay. So if it's the third turn, we change players, and then we do this. So then I think what we want to do is do a put this in an else. We only want to put this inside of an else, all right? And then, if it is the third turn, we want to uh, disable this button again. Um, yes. So no matter what, we want to disable the button on the third roll. I think that works. Let's go ahead and run that and see now. Because the user has to keep the, the points of the third roll no matter what, if they get to the third roll. Like, for instance, let's try and get a scenario here. So in this turn, in this case, we never got a ship captain and a crew. Let's work it again. Okay, so now that was the third turn of player two. So they are going to have to keep the score no matter what. They don't have the option of keeping that score or not. Let's try it. So now, here we go. Now this was the second turn. So the user now has the option to keep the score or they can roll again. So that's why, you know, they could keep it. Or they could, and then once they do keep it, this should end their turn and score up that point and add it to their total here. Or they could roll again, and now this would be the third uh, roll, and now they have no other option to keep it. So we're just going to do that for them automatically and just disable this button, okay? So that's sort of why I, I made that logic there of saying, on the third turn, disable this button again. All right, so now I think is a good time to sort of work on the actual point mechanism, uh, scoring up the total and accumulating the player t player's totals as we go along. So let's work on that next. All right, so we're finally at the section of totaling up all the points here during any given turn, okay? So in order to do that, let's just sort of recap here. There's two main ways that we're going to end up adding points to our overall score. So everyone starts off at zero, and we press play, and then we roll. We only have our captain right now. We roll again, and we roll again, and we didn't get anything. We didn't get our crew, so we don't get any points. So now it's player two's turn. They're going to roll. Okay, so now they got their points here, right on the first roll, which is great. So now they have two more options to get higher than four, or they can just keep it. So if they were to keep it, we would say, okay, your score is four, add those points over here, and now it's player's one's turn, player one's turn, or they can roll again, and now this is eight. So again, same thing, they have the option to keep, and eight would be added to their score here, or they could roll again, and now it's back to, well, unfortunately, now it's back to four again, so which is less than eight, but oh well, that was the user two's fault. So now we would just add four, because now that was their last turn. They don't get another roll. Uh, so that's actually a good thing, too. No, nope, never mind. Uh, that's fine. Um, so yeah, we would add four to their points here now, okay? So like I said, there's only two ways of getting points. Either at the end of the third turn, if they have a ship, a captain, and a crew then add up their points. Or if they press the keep button, then just add up their points also. Because the only way they can press the keep button is if they already have a ship, a captain, and a crew, and it's not the end of the third turn yet. All right, so let's kind of work on... Let's work on the keep logic, because I think that one's a little bit easier. Because we already have a function specifically for the keep logic here. And again, we can only get into this button if they have their ship, the captain, and the crew, and it's not the end of the third turn yet, okay? So, uh, in order to do this, we're gonna need some way to get the total of the points, so I think our dice controller should be able to handle that. So we will say, uh, let's say int points equals, or we'll say new points, new points equals uh, dice controller, 
dot get points. Okay, let's go ahead and work on this function now, actually. So I'll go into the dice pane and we'll create a new method called public void get points. Okay. Um, let's see, how can we do this now? Because now we need a way to be able to get only the values that are not... Oops, didn't mean to go here. Uh, now we want a way to get the values, and actually this should return an integer. I'm sorry, this should return an int. But what I'm trying to say here, and for now, just to get rid of this compile error, we'll say return zero. That's fine. And now let's run it here so I can explain what we're trying to do here. Because whenever we get the points, we don't want to get all of them. We only want to get our points that are not a ship or captain or a crew. But that doesn't mean that we want only things that are not a four, a five, or a six, though, because in this case, we still need this four, right? So we need a way to keep track if we already have logged a certain number as our ship or captain or our crew. And actually, we already have that now that I think about it. We already have that with our lock method. Uh, so yeah, pretty much actually all we need to do is go through all of our dice again. And if it's not locked, we'll then just return that value. So we can just say, here we'll say uh, int total equals zero. And then if the die is not locked, so if not die locked is locked, yep. We'll say total plus equals die dot get value. And now at the end of here, we just return total. There, that was actually a lot easier than I thought, okay? So we can save that now, and back inside of our main, we see our new points equals get points. And now we just add these points to the user's totals. So we'll again come over here, and we'll say kind of this logic here. If it's player one's turn, well then we need to uh, scoreboard dot what does it say? Update, yeah, player one score. Otherwise, we are going to update players two score with the new points. All right, so let's try and work on this keep button now. And we'll go ahead and run this. And this should work. All right, let's try and get our ship captain crew. There we go. So we'll go ahead and keep. And there, now we got uh, player one is four. So now with this keep button, we should also end the score here. And actually, when we update someone's score, we should also put a little message down here that sort of indicates what actually just happened now. So let's go ahead and update our message center as well. So let's go ahead and let's see. We will create another method for this because I feel like we're going to need this for the end of turn uh, method of adding points as well. So we'll say private void... Um, update points. We'll just say it's that for now. And let's go ahead and actually accept the uh, int of new points. And I can just go ahead and actually do this part here. And then go ahead and do this part over here. A little bit of that, a little bit of that. Okay. So same thing, I just uh, extracted this logic out onto its own little method now. And now we want, let's say our message is going to be a string new message. Is, and actually let's use a string builder. A tiny bit of an optimization here. String builder is going to equal a new string builder. Yep. Uh, so we are going to say, do something like plus, and then down here, I'll say, actually, no, we can say uh, plus new points here. 
All right, it's just to sort of show you guys what I'm thinking in my head right now. What we're actually going to be doing is whenever the user updates, uh, whenever the points are going to be updated to the scoreboard, we want the message board to say something like this. Let's say they got six points. We, the message board would say uh, plus six points for player one. Okay, so that's what our, our goal is for right now. That's kind of what we're trying to work towards. So this is going to be uh, plus new points for player and now down here we want this to be uh, if it's player one we want to say uh, new message dot append a one otherwise it's gonna be player two so for player two and now down here we will say uh, message center dot update message for our new message dot to string. All right, and let's see what that looks like now. And again, this is only happening when we uh, press the keep button here. So, okay, so there we go. So now we should see seven go up here and plus seven for player one when I press the keep button here. There we go, plus seven let's say plus seven points for player one, all right? And then, so I'll do that, I'll add in points here. And then I also wanna end the user's turn. When they press the keep button, let's end the user's turn and bring it over to the next user, okay? So let's say we said this is going to be plus seven points for player whatever, um, okay? And now on the keep button, we're now gonna also change players. So I think we could just go right ahead to do this method here. And we say change players. And go ahead and save that. And let's rerun this now. All right, so we roll, we roll. There we go. Yes, plus seven points for player one. There we go. And we also need to end that turn, actually. Um, Right. Let's see what this looks like again here. If we weren't to press that. So we'll play, we'll go, that was the first roll, that was the second roll, that was the third roll. You know, I kind of don't like, it does get a little bit confusing. So let's go ahead and say, uh, let's move this down here. Instead of say turn whatever, we're gonna say this was roll one of whatever, this was roll two of, re of three, this was roll three of three, so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and change some stuff up a little bit actually with our design, okay? So I'm gonna put, instead of this label right here, I'm gonna essentially just move this down inside here and say uh, roll one, two, or three right in the center, right below our dice. All right, so in order to do that, um, we're gonna take, take it out from the scoreboard. And I can kind of just copy and paste a lot of the same stuff here. And I'm just gonna move it into our dice pane instead. And instead of turn counter, let's call it roll counter. So we know uh, what roll number has just been done. Okay. And let's go back into scoreboard. Uh, change up a lot of this stuff stuff and, or copy and paste a lot of the stuff rather. So we'll copy that, move it down into, where is that other dice pane here? In the constructor. All right, after all that stuff, we can do this. And again, this is now going to be our roll counter. All right, and now we want that to specify roll instead of turn. Okay, and all that's gonna be the same. Maybe I'll even make it a little bit smaller. I'll say it's a font size 12. And now I want it to still be, um, for the X, I want it to still be right in the middle there. But for the Y, let's move it down like, let's say like 10 pixels here. I might need to move it more to be honest, but let's just see what that looks like right now. Actually, yeah, because the dice are gonna be 50 pixels alone. So we actually should say 60. So that means it's gonna be 10 pixels below the last dice. 
So actually, let's make this a little bit more formal here because we do already have dice margin, right? Uh, yeah, dice width and dice margin, okay. So let's go ahead and say we want this to be uh, dice height. So layout constants dot dice height plus uh, dice margin. And then uh, times the negative one. Yep, because we want that to go underneath. So let's see what that looks like now. Let's go ahead and run this again. And I do still need to remove it from the scoreboard. I can do that in a second here. All right, and I didn't actually add it now. So let's go ahead and add the roll counter to the actual view, to our, uh, our root border pane here. And I might as well go ahead and just remove all of this as well here. Delete you, delete you. All right, and come up here and delete you. Probably get some little errors up here now. Update turn counter. That's going to change some stuff later on, so I'm not going to worry about that yet because I do need to change this method, wherever it is, from scoreboard over to our uh, dice pane instead. But, okay, let's go ahead and run this right now. There we go, except... Let's see, why did you go up? You should have went down. Um... Yeah, I'm in the dice pane. And that's supposed to be a dice height, which is 100. Oh, it's supposed to be 100 divided by 2, by the way. That's that's why. So this is actually supposed to be uh, 100 divided by 2. There we go. Uh, let's try... Plus a dark dice margin, though. That still shouldn't have done that. Let's see. What am I, what am I doing wrong here? I'm doing something silly here. Let's see. Where is this going to lie now? That is actually... Okay. So when I say it's negative, it actually goes up. I guess my interpretation of the coordinate system is sort of backwards because negative should be this way and negative should be down, not up. So either way, let's go ahead and try and put it under then and I'll just say, uh, I guess that should be positive for whatever reason. Let's go ahead and do that. There we go. And maybe a little bit more of a margin here and we'll say, uh, we'll give it like an extra 10 here. So let's just say plus 20. Make it a little bit lower. There we go. I like that better. Okay. So now we do need to change up a couple things as well because now um, we should hide this on start. And now we should hide this right now as well. And once the user did their first roll... Now it should say roll two, or actually this should say roll one, sorry. This should be roll two, this should be roll three, and then this should be roll one again, and so on and so forth, okay? So uh, let's go ahead and change all of that. So now within our dice pane, we need a way to first hide our dice label. So that should be actually as simple as in our constructor, we'll just set it to be an empty string here. And now we're also going to need some ways of sort of updating the uh, counter as well. So let's create a new method here and we'll say uh, public void update roll counter. And this will accept it int and we'll say uh, roll count. And it should be just as simple as saying uh, roll counter label. dot set uh, text yep and let's go ahead and create a new string text equals roll roll count so roll one of three for instance all right and then we just set the text with the text here okay and that should work there and now we actually need to call this method all right so let's first before i forget let's go back into scoreboard here and let's actually delete this method now 
And now we can figure out where it actually was called at, right over here. And let's see if this is the same logic that we need now. Because uh, the logic, like I said, works a little bit differently now. We only want to show this after the roll. So once the dice have been rolled, we roll dice, and now we should show the actual uh, uh, dice count now. So we'll say uh, dice controller dot, what did I say? It was update roll counter with the actual count. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll roll the dice. We'll say the turn counter plus plus. And now we update that accordingly. So that should work. Let's go ahead and run this now and see what that looks like here. All right, so it's nothing. And then we said, um, right, so once we roll it, right, we actually do want to show it before we increment it because when we rolled it, we're rolling it on our current turn. All right, so let's go ahead and switch those up again. And uh, let's try and run this again here. All right, so we roll the dice. This was roll one of three. This was roll two of three. All right, let's go ahead and keep. All right, so now this should go back to uh, showing blank, actually. So plus three players for player one. So now one we keep, let's go ahead and remove this label again. All right, so let's go ahead and stop that. Let's go down to the keep method here. Where is this keep method? It should be down here. On keep method, update the points. Uh, we also want to do the dice controller uh, dot. We should create some sort of method here that says uh, hide um, roll count. So we'll say hide roll counter. We'll do that. And it's going to complain because it has no idea what I'm talking about so far. So let's go ahead and create this. And we'll just say uh, public void hide roll counter. And all we do is this same thing up here. Um, actually, let's just go ahead and do this. Easy way of just hiding it is just setting it to an empty string. All right. Uh, let's see what that looks like now. I know it gets tedious, you know, code a little, test a little, code a little, test a little, but it helps to identify bugs very early on. So it might take a little bit longer. It might seem like it takes a little bit longer, but on the grand scheme of things, it actually speeds things up a lot. So we'll go ahead and click on roll again. So this was roll one of three. This was roll two of three. This was roll, roll three of three. And we'll work on this logic now because now uh, it should add 11 to player one's total. And now it's player two's turn. So we roll again. There we go. That was roll one of three, roll two of three, roll three of three. I'm trying to verify the keep button works here. So I need to get my ship, my captain, and my crew either in my first roll or my second roll. And so far I'm failing to do that. There we go. Roll one of three. Uh, let's just do... One more, there we go. So now this is roll two or three. So now this should add six to player two. I should see the message there. And it should be player one's turn with no roll there. All right, so we'll go ahead and keep. All right, six points to player two. And actually I should be able to disable. Once we press keep, we should disable the keep button again, but I'll work on that in a minute. And now it's player one's turn. So now I will press roll. And we also need to reset the roll counter. So on keep, we need to do two things. We need to reset the roll counter, and then we also need to disable the keep button. Okay, so let's go ahead and work on that. So on keep, that will be within our main here. On keep, we need to disable the keep button again. All right, so that's going to be in our button pane dot uh, keep. Set keep disable to true. And now we also need to update our turn counter. So now uh, turn, and didn't doesn't change players do that? Um, let's see here. Because change players should. 
No, it does not. Change players doesn't. So actually, we should handle that inside change players. So once you change players, the turn count should be uh, one again. So inside change players, I'm going to say uh, turn... What is it called? Uh, turn counter. Let's go ahead and actually rename this right now. And I'll say uh, roll count. Uh, refactor, that's what I'm looking for. I want to change this to uh, roll count equals one. And... Uh, okay. So I need to first... It was complaining because I had a compilation error because of right here. So let's go ahead and say this is turn counter equals one again. And now let's go ahead and change this. Refactor, rename, and I want to rename this just to uh, roll count. I think it's, it just explains it a little bit better. So let's just go ahead and save that. And now let's see what this looks like here. All right, so we play, there we go. Roll one of three. So I'm going to keep seven here, seven points for player one. All right, and now it's player two's turn and the only option they have is to roll. So that was their roll one of three. That was their roll two of three. And that was their roll three of three. So now we need to work on the logic where uh, at the end of roll three of three, the player either gets points or they don't get points. In this case, they should get points. They should have, player two should have had four points added and the message center should have been updated accordingly. So let's go ahead and work on that logic of it now. And this again is gonna be in our main. After our roll, we need to check a few other things here. So if the roll count is greater than three, I don't really like that actually. Uh, let's go ahead and not increment yet. We'll say if the roll count is equal to three, okay? If the roll count is equal to three, then change the stuff where roll count should equal one. And then you change players, which also changes it to one. Um, so I'll work on that in a minute. Oh, that's why. So I actually don't even need this anymore. Okay. That's what I was thinking before. That's why I thought change players already changed it to, to one, but it wasn't. So now that change players does... Uh, change the roll count back to one. I don't need it here anymore. But now if it's not the third roll, now I do want to increment the roll count, okay? Um, I like changing things. Uh, uh, no, I was going to say, I like changing conditionals to be a little bit more verbose. And I was thinking of like, change to is, end of turn. Um, but I, I don't know if it's all that more verbose, verbose or not. So let's just go ahead and leave it to if the roll count is equal to three. So it's the same story. Um, what are we working on again? Uh, if the roll count is three, then we need to add up the points, okay? So kind of like the keep method here. In this case, we get the points no matter what, because we already know the only way to press the keep button is if they have their ship, their captain, or their crew. In this case, though, if it's the third roll, we need to check if they have their ship, captain, or crew. All right, so uh, we can really just say check four points. Okay. So I think we could probably handle this logic somewhere down here. We could say private void check for points. All right, and now what we want to say is uh, if dice controller dot has ship captain and crew, we'll then uh, do the same thing before, but update points. So we should say this here. We pretty much just say this. And actually, if I'm updating points, this should really be inside of here anyway. So let's go ahead and refactor this a little bit. I'm just gonna say update points, and I'm gonna let the update points method handle its own extraction of getting the actual points here, okay? There we go. Because now I can just call update points inside the check for points. So check for points, if it has the ship and the captain and the crew, well then update the points. And that should work that should pretty much be it, except for the actual winning of the game here. So let's go ahead and run this now. And now we'll play, and we'll roll. That was one, that was two. Let's let it go through on three. And now, there we go. Six plus three equals nine. So nine, play, nine points were added for player one. 
Now it's player two's turn. Um, what I also want to do is remove this message on the next roll. So after the next player has rolled their first turn, let's clear out the message center again. Okay, so once they press roll and it's their first turn, uh, yep, on roll. If it's the first turn, unlock all dice, but we should also clear out the message center. So message center dot update message with just an empty string here. And let's run this again. All right. So we'll play. We'll say, there we go. Let's. That was our first roll. We already got our ship, our captain, and our crew. We can roll again. We got 10 here. Our, the maximum we can get is 12, so getting 10 is actually really good. So we're going to go ahead and keep that. And there we go. 10 points added for player 1. And now player 2, only thing they can do is roll. That was their first roll. This is their second roll. Everything turned out to be the same, I guess. So this was their third roll. And there we go. So now there should be 8 points added to player 2. And accordingly, now it's player 1's turn again. And they will roll. And it's 9 and 6. Uh, that's only 4. So... Uh, Sorry, I shouldn't have said nine. Uh, we got the four, the five, and the six. We have our shipper, captain, our crew. So our total points is four. I think we can get higher than that with another roll. And we did. So now we did get nine. And there we go. So I actually screwed that up a little bit because now this was 10 and it should have been plus nine. So this should be 19, but I accidentally overwrote it with uh, the points every single time. So that's a bug. Let's go ahead and fix that now. All right, so... When we update the points, this should be in the update points method. We just say update message. Or nope, that should be actually in the scoreboard. When do we update the scoreboard here? Right here, update the scoreboard. So we say uh, we should update it with the new points. So let's actually handle that inside scoreboard. So I instead of update player one score or update player two score, what we, what we really should be saying is uh, add points to player 2 score or add points to player 1 score. So let's go ahead and change these now. All right, so this should be, yeah, update here. Let's go ahead and refactor this. We're going to rename it. We're going to say uh, add points to player 1 score. All right, and it's going to update everywhere else. That's awesome. And let's go ahead and refactor this. And we'll rename this to add points to player two score instead. Okay. So now what we need to do is now we need to extract out what the actual value is supposed to be. So I'm assuming there's got to be a way to get the text here. So first thing we need to do is we need to get the current score. We need to say int current points equals player one score label dot get text and now we need to cast this to an integer so integer dot parse int oops all right i can fix that in a minute here and really i just need to extract it from this here okay and now i need to say uh, this should be new points here and now I can just say int uh, total new points is going to be the current points plus the new points and now change that to that and this should all be a copy and paste pretty much I'll change this to player two. This should be new points, control C, control V, and this should also be a uh, two. So let's go ahead and extract this out as well. I'm going to say this is what again? This is a type of player score label. So player score label uh, player is going to equal player two score label. And this should actually be score. Okay. And now with that, I can replace that with that. And the reason I want to do that is because now I can take this and I'm going to go to refactor and extract method. And now this is going to be a private. 
And this is just going to be uh, add points to player score. And it should have done the same thing over here, but it didn't. Uh, so let's go ahead and just change this now to player one. There we go. So just a little bit cleaner code, uh, you know, removing some duplicate code here. So now when we add points to player one score, we're going to take the points and we're going to say, hey, use this method, but using the player one score label. And then instead of it's add it to player two score, we're going to call this method, but using the player two score method instead. And again, what we're going to be doing is grabbing the current points from the actual text, casting it to an integer. Then we're just going to add the old points and the new points, and we're going to update the text of the new points. So let's go ahead and run this again now and make sure that this all works perfectly. All right, and we're going to play. And there we go, three points added. Now it's player two's turn. And there we go, five points. All right. Now it's player one's turn again, and there we go. So now it's seven points added. So they had three before, now it's plus seven. So now they have a total of 10. All right. And there we go. So I forgot what they had. Yeah, they had five and now plus two. So that should equal nine, or sorry, plus four, four player two. So four plus five equals nine. Now it's player one's turn again. And we'll go ahead and keep six. So that should turn to 16. All right, so all that seems to be working fine. Now the only thing that's left is to determine a winner. So I think uh, the way the game is played is up the first one to 50 wins, or maybe it's 25 or something, I'm not too sure. Let's call it uh, 50 for now. Uh, or actually, let's call it 25 so the game ends a little bit quicker. Um, because I actually don't know off the top of my head. Um, let's go ahead and put this inside the main here, and we will say uh, private int... Uh, winning sc winning score, we'll call that, equals 50. All right. So now every time that the score has been updated, all right, once we update points, what do we need to do when we update points here? We need to do... We kind of need to do a couple things, actually. Um... So first thing we should do is also keep track if a winner is found. So private boolean winner found equals false. And I'll show you why we kind of need to do this in a minute here. All right. Uh, because basically there's a couple different things that rely on the fact that if a winner was not found, we want the game to keep on moving. But if a winner was found, then we don't want to execute any other stuff except for the ending game um, method you know we'll create an end game method that does like it shows the winner and it disables the role button and replays the play button and everything else or reshows the play button and everything else so um basically now once we roll the dice we update the roll counter and then we check all this stuff here uh once we check for points yeah, so we should only change players. That's what we're looking for. We only want to change players if a, if a winner has not been found. Okay? So that happens on the uh, end of roll three. And then it also happens on the keep. Okay? So I think I could handle it inside change players. So inside change players, we should only change players. So if... Um, not winner found, then go ahead and change players here. All right. So I do like that. That's fine. And now we can determine if a winner was uh, found or not inside the update points method, I believe. So now once we update the points, now let's check for a winner. All right. Um, before we do that, let's go ahead and uh, check for winner. So we need to be able to check for a winner within the dice pane. So I'll say um, if dice controller, uh, well, how should we do this? Should we handle the logic inside the dice controller or handle it inside here? Um, yeah, we don't really, we don't really need the points 
to actually come back inside of here. So we should handle it inside the dice controller. So uh, dice controller dot check for winner of the player whose ever turn it is. So we'll say um, player turn. Okay. So if is winner, we'll say if is winner. How about that instead? If is winner, player turn. All right. Um, so if they are a winner, and we'll fix that in a minute, well, then we just kind of need an end game. So we say uh, winner found equals true. And because of all that, actually, um, let's go ahead and remove this. And this should actually be inside the dice controller here. Okay. So let's go ahead and make this method now. And we'll just say uh, public is public boolean is winner. And this will accept the integer of the player turn. Okay. So now if it's player one, so if player turn is equal to one, else it's player two. So if it's player one's turn, let's get player one's points. Okay. And to do that, we need to, I think we have a method for that, don't we? Uh, yep, get points here. So we'll say, and actually, yeah, since we already have a get points, why do we need that? Apparently, our main method does need get points at some point. Right, to update the scoreboard. So we, we could have handled that inside here, uh, but either way, it doesn't really matter, I guess. We'll just say, uh, we'll, we'll handle it inside the dice contr controller itself. So we'll say, um, no, we need this from the scoreboard. Right, our, our dice controller doesn't handle that. We need that from the scoreboard. Our scoreboard should be handling if there's a winner or not. All right, so let's go ahead and change all this. Our scoreboard needs to handle if there's a winner or not. I'm sorry. I'm being silly right now. So let's go back down to here, and we need to say um, scoreboard is winner. Okay. So now let's go into the scoreboard and see if we can create this uh, is winner method here. So now we're going to create a public boolean is winner, and it's going to be uh, integer of a player turn. And then same thing, if uh, public, not pubic, there we go. If player turn is equal to one, then do this, else it must mean it's player two, so let's do that. All right. So... And actually, both of those are going to share the same logic. So again, we can do something similar that we did over here. We'll kind of do this. We'll say we're going to have a player score. Okay. Oops. That's going to be a control C. And if it's player one, well, then our player score is going to be the player one score label. Else, that means it's player two. So then that's going to be the player two score label. Now let's go ahead and get the points like we did before. All right. And now we just need to verify that the points are less than the winning points. And again, we'll probably just say it's like uh, 25 for right now. So we'll say uh, final int points to win equals 25. So if, we'll say those are just points, points is greater than or equal to the points to win, then return true, else return false, and I don't really like like the if this and return true, else return, it's just kind of redundant, so really what I'm just going to uh, refactor this to then is just return that the points are greater than or equal to the points to win. And now I can just remove this here. All right. And there, that should be it. Uh, yeah. So the scoreboard will handle if there's a winner or not. And we can save that, go back over to here. All right. So if there is a winner, then winner is found. So now we want to update that. We're going to update the message center. And we're going to say message center. And in order to 
deduplicate the logic. Actually, no, that doesn't matter because we already have. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just kind of rambling on. Uh, let's update the message center. Message center dot update message, and it'll say something like player one has won the game. Or we'll just say player one wins. How about that? Player one wins. And instead of a one, a hard coding the one there. We're going to change this to player turn. All right. And now, uh, now we can say else we will update the message to that. Okay. And then if the player did win, we want to disable stuff too. So uh, not only disable, we actually want to physically hide the roll button and hide the keep button and then put back on the play button. Okay. Let's go ahead and try that. So now we should say uh, button pane dot... Don't we have a reset? No, let's call it button pane dot end game. Let's do that. We'll have our button pane handle that itself. So I'll create another public void end game. And what this is going to do is it's going to hide the roll button. So I'll set roll button visible to false. All right. Set the play button to true. And then the keep button to false. All right. Um, let's see here. I wonder if you can put a breakpoint, uh, a break inside of the label. I'm not sure. Let's see. Let's see if we can try that here. Um, on the message center, we can try that. Uh, message pane. Click play to begin. Uh, yeah, how do we do that? Like new line, I guess. New line. Hello world. Let's try that. I don't. I don't think that's gonna work though. To be honest. Let's see. That does work. What do you know? That's awesome. That's really cool. Okay. So the reason I wanted to test that was because inside here, once the player does win, let's put a new line and we'll say uh, click the play button to play again. Okay. And let's see what that looks like now. Let's go ahead and, and try and run this here. All right. So first one at 25 wins. So I'm just going to roll through all these quick and let's see what happens here. So player one has 20 now. There we go. Player one wins. Click the play button to play again. And now when we play again, uh, we need to reset everything. So, you know, Unlock all these, hide this again, and reset the scores back to zero. Put player one back at player one. All right, so I think the main should be able to handle most of that. Um, so don't we already have a reset method that I said we would delete earlier, and it turns out we're actually not going to do that. So when we reset the game, all right, and resetting the game is by pressing the play button. So actually, is that different than the start game? Because don't we have a start game method? Yeah, start game. Um, right. So actually, all we need to do is just uh, do start game again. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. I don't even need a reset. I just want start. And when we do press start, we're updating the message back to nothing there. Uh, we need to update that as player one's turn again. So we could say um, scoreboard dot, actually I'll, I'll just say uh, start game inside here as well. We'll call uh, scoreboard start game. 
because really it's going to be the scoreboard that like handles almost everything else that we need here. So right here, actually, should, this should be at the top after the constructor. Let's say public void start game. All right, and we should initialize our labels back to zero. So this will be uh, player one score label dot set text. Bring that back down to zero. Do the same exact thing for player two. And then indicate that it's player one's turn. And is that everything I said? Uh, let's see here. Go back in here. I don't actually know if I need this anymore. Let's go ahead and remove that and just kind of see what we're dealing with so far. So let's rerun this now. All right, click play to begin. Uh, so right off the bat, we do want to hide all of these. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, so when we initialize the layout here, let's just go ahead and uh, button pane. Actually, really, that should be handled in the button pane, actually. When we init the button pane. Initialize button pane. Oh, right here. Okay. Um, right. When we initialize the button pane, let's go ahead and say button pane dot... I could call this start game also. So we'll go ahead and create a start game in the button pane. And we need to go to the button pane. And we have an end game, so let's go ahead and create a start game. Public void start game. And this should just do kind of the opposite of all of this here. All right. So when you start the game, we want... Actually, no, that should still be um, end game. But just for, uh, let's see, how, how could we do this? Um, because they're going to do the same functionality. So right now I'm just trying to think of the best name for this. I could be like initialize game. It could be restart game, um, end game. Uh, yeah, we could just say set up for end of game screen or uh, what's a good name for this? Uh, again, naming variables and naming method names and, and class names and everything else. One of the hardest things in programming. Um, I guess just for time's sake, so let's just go ahead and say... Uh, init game start screen. Let's do that. Or we'll call it layout. Okay. Control save that. Uh, let's go back into here. I should have to update it twice. So now we should init the game start layout. And down here, when we end the game, we'll init the game start layout again. I think that should work. Let's see here. Maybe I did it wrong again, uh, as always. We'll just try and... So that actually works so far. Let's see what our end game looks like. We'll cruise through here to try and get uh, a winner here. It looks like player one's probably going to win. There we go. And that works great, actually. Player one wins. Click play to play again. All right. Um, ooh, that's right. Again, once we uh, play again... We do need to update the roll counter again. So the end game should update the roll counter. So when a winner is found, all right, when a winner is found, um, we should also, I think we could, let's see, when a winner is found, Yeah, we'll just say uh, roll counter, roll count equals one. I think that's all we need. Let's see here. What are we actually trying to do again? Let's see. Let's get back to a winner. All right, so, oh no. There we go. So player one wins, 
click the play button to play again. So, oh, that's right. When we press play, okay, so when we press play, we want to remove this uh, line here. So I actually don't think we need this. But when we click the play button, on the play action, we should hide our role message there. So on the play action, there we go, which is just the start game method. So inside the start game method, we should say um, this will be in our dice controller dot uh, update roll counter. And it should be hide roll counter actually. So, yep, we do have a hide roll counter. Okay, there we go. That's what we want. Dot hide roll counter. Okay. And then the scoreboard starts the game and everything else. So, I think that works. Um, let's see. Let's go ahead and run this now. All right, so let's go ahead and play a real game here. Oh, uh, it's only three. I think we can get higher. There we go. We got 11. That's a good start. Uh, we're missing our crew. There we go. We got our crew, but only three points for player two. Let's go ahead and do player one again. And we got nine. We'll go ahead and keep that. That's a high score. Now it's player two's turn. And there we go. We got uh, eight there. Player one again. No points. And now it's player two's turn. We got four. I think we can, on our third roll, I think we can get higher than four. But we didn't. Oh, well. All right. Nine, we'll go ahead and keep that because now we just won the game. There we go, player one wins. Click the play button to play again. All right, everything gets set back down to zero. We already got our ship captain, our crew. Oh, nope, we didn't actually roll yet though. So um, when we play, when we press the play button, we also need to unlock all the uh, things again too. So start game. Um, and really, I could say dice controller unlock all of them, but since I already have like two things going on, I'm just going to do the same idea here. And the dice controller is going to have its own start game method as well. So, or start game method. Yeah, I think I said that. Okay. Anyways, so now it's going to start controller, or sorry, the dice controller, our dice pane here. And we're going to create a start game method, public void start game. And what this is going to do is it's going to hide the roll counter and it's going to unlock all dice here. Yep, unlock all dice. There we go. Let's try that. All right, let's go ahead and play. We'll roll. All right, no points for player one. There we go, 11 points for player two. No points for player one again. Uh, four points for player two, so they're at 15 now. No points for player one again. Uh, six, let's see if we get higher. There we go, 11, we'll keep that. And there, player two wins this time. So now we'll play again. All right, there we go. Unlocks all the dice, now player one needs to roll. That was not their first roll. So we did need to keep, um, we need to update the player turn also. So we need to update the player turn and we need to update the roll counter on a start game. All right, so we'll go back to main here. So when we start a game, we need to say our roll count equals one. We need to say our player turn also equals one. Now I thought we already did that at other points, but I guess not actually, no, we, we didn't. That's right, okay. So let's go ahead and save that. Let's test this out now. And again, now we're coming down to the point where we're just trying to play it, flush out any more bugs that we can find in the system, and just make sure we have a really robust system here, a really robust game. Uh, so we have five there. I think we could get some more points. And we did not, but we got five. All right, now it's player two's turn. And again, I'm just going to start cruising through this thing, get uh, a winner here. All right, so player one's turn again. Look at that all. Almost all sixes but no winning dice there. There we go, player two wins. All right, they got uh, an additional nine points added on to what they had. Um, 
let's go ahead and press play again. All right, and it's player one's turn. So that was their first roll. That's good. That's good. Let's go ahead and keep six. But we didn't update for player two now. Oh, you know what? I bet you it's because we didn't, um, yeah, we, we didn't reset this winner found variable here. So when we start the game, uh, winner found should be set back down to false. All right. Um, and I'm questioning if we even need this variable anymore anyways, but let's just go ahead and see this for a minute. All right. We're going to test it again here. And uh, we'll click play run through this a bunch of times, get a winner. There we go, player one wins. All right, we'll plus, press play again, and we're gonna roll. That was roll one of three, roll two of three, roll three of three, no points. And now it goes down to player two. And we got 10 here, we'll keep 10 points for player two. We got six, we got eight, we'll keep eight points for player one. All right, so now it seems to be working a little bit better. Can we get higher than seven? All right, we couldn't, that was six though. So let's go ahead and go through, try and play another game here. Find another winner. There we go. Player two wins again. So now we'll play again. Player one's turn. And that was their first roll. There's five. There's ten. We'll keep that. There we go. All right. So I think that's the full game there. Um, that's pretty much it. There we go. So, yeah. That's the full game there. Um, there's... You know, some more customization, we could probably go on with this, too. You know, we could take this even further. Let's, uh, I'm not going to. You know, this would be some, like, homework for you guys to try. But you could go and make the names customizable. Or you could set the number of points to win to be customizable, customizable as well. Instead of maybe 25 points, we can say maybe we'll have it, the winning score be 50 points or something else instead. Um, you know, maybe there's, like, a few other things as well. But... I think for the most part, this is a solid functioning game, has some mostly clean code in here. I think there's probably a few things we could probably clean up a little bit, but for the most part, it's actually pretty clean code. We have separated things into their own classes and everything else. Um, yeah. So check the links below for, or check the description below for any links to where the source code is going to be hosted at. If you want to sort of verify and kind of follow along, or maybe you miss something and you just kind of want to bounce off of your application compared to my code. But yeah, this was how to build ship captain crew using Java FX. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please smash that thumbs up button. Make sure you do subscribe so you can get notified when we come out with new uh, JavaFX game development courses or tutorials or anything else. And until next time, everyone, happy coding.